Yeah. Okay, I'll call the meeting to order and uh, Cornell City Council recognizes that we meet on the traditional territory of the Latako Dene Nation. Uh, we have uh, for the agenda, uh, we have the documentation for K-5, you should have all uh, received. That's the Catalyst Program Grant application. And then we have a letter under correspondence, so item M2, uh, a letter from Barkerville with respect to our tender water our truck unit. Uh, other than that, the agenda is as is, and we'll see what happens uh, with the second delegation. Uh, so with that, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Councillor Runge, Councillor Rudenberg, anyone opposed? Okay, that motion has passed. Uh, and in the adoption of the regular minutes, our special electronic council meeting minutes of May 5, motion to adopt, Councillor Elliott, Seconded, Councillor Vic. Anyone opposed? Councillor Paul. Yeah, do you have a comment? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I do have a comment, and I was um, opposed to Resolution Number One Five Two One Six Zero and One Six One, which are all relative to the, uh, the, the the budget. And I did try to get your attention to ask that my name be recorded as being opposed. And I'm wondering if it's possible during this time of, of doing the Zoom meetings that, that the chair of the meeting ask if uh, in the case of when there's someone that's voting in opposition, uh, if they would like their name recorded. I know that that's not the protocol, but I honestly did try to get your attention and uh, you had moved on and I didn't want to suffer the wrath, so I just left it be. So, Councillor Paul, um, number one, our procedures remain our procedure. Number two, uh, I don't think we can retroactively change the minutes. Um, so I will make a point of pausing when we've had some substantive discussion and a member of council has made a comment that suggests they may be voting in the negative, I will pause uh, and take uh, a look uh, to give council members the opportunity to waive or uh, interject. Uh, so I would suggest for council members, because uh, you're in the habit of muting, which is awesome, but if we're coming to a vote and you have an intention to vote in the nay uh, and have you know, basically intimated as such, unmute during the vote, so you can verbalize uh, that you want to be recorded. Uh, and that way we're not into, you know, handshakes or head shakes or anything like that. So, uh, will that suffice, Council Paul? Okay, I see him nodding his head. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I believe we just got second and did we take the vote? No. Okay, so anyone opposed to the minutes? Okay, no opposition, uh, the minutes have passed. Uh, so with respect to the delegations, oh, and I see uh, our wonderful folks down in the CRD ha have joined us, so uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to go to uh, uh, Ricky, or, sorry, Nikki and Jeff. Ricky and Jeff, I was right the first time, Ricky. Uh, uh, with respect to the Enbridge update, uh, this was an update that was given to the CRD prior to the project starting. And I thought it was important for council to be aware of the Cornell project, how it fits into the big scheme of things, but now that it's going. And so uh, I'll turn the floor to you, uh, Ricky, and you and Jeff can coordinate uh, the presentation. Thanks for being here tonight. Great. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, council and uh, the CRD for joining us today. So. We are, we do have a presentation. We're gonna talk about the project at Australian, um, as well as just there is some operations and maintenance projects also in the area, including one small project right in the um, Quinnell city limits. And so Jeff Smedley is here. Um, he's our lands and right of way specialist, uh, joining me to, to talk a little bit about that as well. So do we have the presentation up? So your co-host, you should be able to switch your screen. Is it 
Natasha or Ricky that should be? Oh, Ricky. Ricky. Yeah, sorry. So hang on one second, Ricky. We're going to make you a co-host. Great. You got a main yeah. screen in the front, Carrie? Yeah. Okay, so now you should be able to switch screen. Okay. Sorry. Give me one second. I just need to pull it up. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how to share my screen. What's that? I'm not sure. How, oh, it doesn't look like I have a share screen option. So the other option, Ricky, is if you just let us know as you flip through the screens, we have color versions of your presentation in okay. our in the package. Okay. So it, will that work for council? You, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Ricky. Why don't you just talk us through uh, your presentation that we have sitting in front of us then? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, okay, so slide one, we just got a quick agenda. As I said, we'll talk a little bit just about operations in BC. Um, the integrity program, which has been pretty significant over the last couple of years since the um, Shelley pipeline incident in October 2018. The T-Self reliability expansion program, which is kind of the big topic that we're going to discuss today um, at the compressor station five. Um, and then just some overall what, what we're doing in the area. So on our second page, you'll see this is just a quick overview since Enbridge and Spectra Energy merged. Um, we are now the uh, one of the largest energy um, companies in all of North America. So this is just a quick overview of, of what, what Enbridge currently looks like. And then we'll move into our operations. So just a quick background on uh, natural gas in our pipeline system. So the gas that's in our transmission system is um, natural gas and it is sweet. So there's no H2S in it. It's lighter than air, colorless and non-toxic, has a slight petroleum smell or hydrocarbon smell. And the tract of land is, is above a pipeline is known as a right-of-way. So we're just gonna be talking about a right-of-way quite a bit today or a row. Um, this area is typically cleared of trees, vegetation buildings and other structures. I will note that we are um, undergoing some vegetation management activities uh, throughout annually kind of throughout and we just re we're just working on our renewal of our vegetation management plan for 2020 um, so you would have received information about that as well um, on the next slide so some operations in BC our facilities have been the backbone of the natural gas sector for more than 60 years 60% um, of the natural gas produced in BC touches our transmission system and this gas is used to heat homes, hospitals, businesses, school. It's used for electric power generation and industrial and manufacturing processes. So um, we, in this map here, you'll see we kind of start Fort St. John, Fort Nelson area, and we go all the way down to Huntington, um, which is near Chilliwack at the, at the border there. Uh, the next slide is just some economic impacts to BC. So just from a high level, we've got approximately 683 permanent and temporary employees and contractors in BC alone. Um, and then some of our tax and economic benefit information is in here as well. So community investment in BC, which is our next slide, um, this is one of the really big things that Enbridge has, has always done, but we've really been going forward uh, and trying to really move the dial when it comes to community investment. Uh, so our procurement and spending across BC ex exceeded 1.5 billion in 2018. This slide is a little bit of data. I don't have the 2019 numbers. Um, and we work and live in your community. So 
the compressor stations, especially uh, the legacy spectra energy assets, um, some of the people who actually still work in our company uh, grew up at some of those compressor stations along the highway. So uh, we're definitely invested in where, where we work and live. So next, Enbridge safety and operations um, is kind of our next section here. So maintaining and monitoring our system. Um, Enbridge, we focus on meeting or exceeding our regulatory and industry safety standards during construction, operations and maintenance and responding 24 seven to any incident. So we do that through monitoring our system with a 24 seven gas control center. Um, uh, we are equipped with automatic leak detection alarms and shutdown systems. We conduct routine aerial patrols by helicopter. Actually, Jeff does that personally um, for third party activity or, or abnormal system conditions. We do pipeline inspection, which we'll talk a little bit more in the next section on because this is really big for us in the last couple of years, which include also includes inline inspections, um, which look for anomalies such as corrosion or mechanical damage. And then doing valve servicing um, kind of consistently and, and annually as we, as we go along. So our next section is our comprehensive integrity program. So in October 2018, as most people are aware, Enbridge experienced a natural gas pipeline rupture on our BC pipeline system, approximately 13.5 kilometers north of Prince George. This had led to a comprehensive pipeline integrity program. That program, um, we looked at everything. We did enhanced pipeline inspections. We improved our maintenance screening criteria and we increased the number of integrity digs. So this is to help prevent similar incidents from occurring and significantly improves pipeline safety. So since that time on our next slide, our entire transmission system has been inspected by the latest generation inline pipeline inspection tool tools and that tool has then doubled the number so that tool has the double the number of sensors than previous inspection tools and it's also increased a doubling uh, approximately of the number of integrity digs so the integrity dig program is quite comprehensive we move to our next slide um, that enhanced screening criteria is to evaluate pipeline inspection data uh, the result of this, again, like I said, has increased the number of integrity digs. The digs, we evacuate a section of pipeline to examine it further, validating the safety and undertaking proactive maintenance work. Um, this year alone, we've doubled the number of digs, like I said. So we are out there doing them. We're starting them now. Uh, and this is all because no incidents is acceptable ever and when it does occur we take it quick and decisive action to ensure the continued safety. So when we get to the operations and maintenance section which Jeff will speak to um, we'll talk a little bit more about, about integrity digs and just what's going on in the region. So on our next section is the T-cell for liability and expansion programs. So this is kind of our the big project that we're talking about today. So the T-Cell Reliability Expansion Program, the overall scope is addition of new compressor units and gas coolers along the system. So as you see on the map here, all of our current compressor stations are in yellow squares. So basically from Chetland through to Huntington Meter Station, almost every single station is undergoing some type of upgrade. All of the orange box or like yellowish orange boxes those are the new compressor units so the new compressor units being installed there's five of them uh mcleod lake summit lake hickson australian and 150 mile house and then all of the green boxes that you see on there are additional upgrades so this is something like a, a new gas cooler a horsepower enhancement um various things like that we can move to our next slide. Compressor station five at Australian is kind of the, the key one for Quinnell. Um, this is installation of a new state-of-the-art compressor unit. The unit will make use of modern low emission technology and noise reduction fe features. And it al also has the addition of a new gas cooler. This installation of equipment, utilities, and buildings is required to support the new unit. 
So the unit at Compressor Station 5 is actually quite unique to the rest of the program. The rest of the program, um, most of the new units are actually replacing old and aging equipment. At Compressor Station 5, there was only one compressor, so there was no backup unit. So Compressor Station 5 is receiving a brand new unit um, and not taking out an old one. The, the one that's currently there will then become the backup unit um, this is to help with reliability, uh, maintenance, and just ensuring our system is, is safe and, and um, we, we won't have any issues in the future. So the new unit will go into place. It'll take over what the old unit's doing and the old one will stay there um, as a backup. So we started, uh, well, we received uh, approval from the Canada Energy Regulator. We started the consultation um, on this project in 2017. We went through the hearing process when it was still the National Energy Board. Um, National Energy Board changed over to the Canada Energy Regulator in August of uh, 2019 and we received approval from them in September of 2019. In November of 2019 we started clearing activities and then the general contractor was awarded in the first quarter of 2020 with construction activities beginning uh, in the spring. So we started about mid-March and we're currently undergoing uh, clearing and earthworks activities at that location. Peak construction is expected for late summer, so August, September of this year, with construction completed in Q4 2021. So Bird Construction was awarded the Compressor Station project. They've, they were also awarded the project at uh, Compressor Station 4B at Hickson, as well as Compressor Station 6A at 150 Mile House. Go to the next slide. So the peak workforce during construction will have approximately 120 people on site at each compressor station. Right now, I, I called the, uh, the construction manager and just asked like how many people are there approximately right now. He said about 70 people. So that's what we've been saying is that the average workforce from beginning to end is about 70 to 80. So we're on target there. All personnel not local to the Quinell area have been encouraged to support local businesses for their day-to-day -day living needs, such as accommodations, fuel, groceries, entertainment. Um, and then we'll have both union and non-union contractors and Indigenous and local contractors have been awarded various scopes of work throughout the construction. We move to our next slide. Community impacts. So during peak construction, the project's workforce could increase, could place increased demand on communities' infrastructure. I know there's quite a few um, bird uh, and contract, bird contractors uh, who've rented accommodations out of Quinell. So there are people there um, on community infrastructure, police, medical, emergency services by increasing the potential for work-related accidents or injuries. Now I will say we do have um, a lot of safety processes in place and I will speak to COVID um, during this presentation as well. Um, in Enbridge in coordination with our general contractors have also impl implemented stringent emergency response plans. We have medics on site um, for both the current, the current compressor unit that's up and running as well as additional medics are there for the new infrastructure. And traffic and access management plans uh, to help reduce overall effects. So our commitment to communities during COVID-19. So we understand this is a challenging time around the world, especially here in BC. Uh, Enbridge is continuing to maintain and operate a safe and reliable energy infrastructure and to ensure the transportation of natural gas continues to our consumers throughout the province. Uh, we're doing our help um, to prevent the spread. We want to reinforce that the Quinnell's and all of the community's health and safety as well as that of our employees and contractors is our number one priority. We mean, we, we're remaining committed to the relationship. Um, we are, we've contributed a number or a significant amount of uh, donations 
to food banks, uh, local indigenous communities to help support during uh, this difficult time. Um, and I think I'm missing a slide actually. I am missing a slide. I'm missing Jeff's slide. Number 11. No, it's Number embedded. 11. Yeah. It's embedded. Number 11. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. So, Jeff, do you have the presentation in front of you? Yep. Great. Can we you speak to the operation of the maintenance activities? I'm sorry, everyone. We'll need to go back to slide 11. I don't know how I missed it. It's okay. Yeah, it's page 20 of the Agenda Council, and at the top says O&M activities in 2020. So the, the big project that you've uh, probably seen driving by racing road area, highways wants to add another lane to that highway on the south side of the highway by uh, Cornell door shop there. In order for that to happen, we have um, a casement around the pipe that goes underneath the highway uh, under Valhalla Road coming out of our crossover valve there. So we have to extend that casing uh, so first before highways can widen the road. So we're in the process of doing that. Our first thing we've done is gone in and checked for contaminants to make sure that the casing hasn't leaked in the last um, many, many years. Uh, all our results so far is that there has been no leakage. So now we're gonna go and we're gonna extend, one pipe will be extended 17 meters and the other two pipes will be about 14 meters that we'll have to extend the casement around that pipe. And that just protects it a little bit so with all the heavy traffic going across the top of it. So that'll continue on through the summer. Um, right now we're in the process of just doing our permits um, with the city of Cornell and the highways in order so we can get started in there. We expect to be in there um, tail end of July and early August. Um, just outside city limits, 10 Mile Lake Road. Um, the sales tap that's on 10 Mile Lake Road uh, is getting an upgrade. So it's, um, We'll be bringing in a trailer to, to supply gas to the, that neighborhood to ensure that continues. That's going to start um, the tail end of June, and uh, it's going to go for about six weeks before we get that finished. Uh, we do have two integrity digs in, in the 5L system, which starts from Australia, Australia and works down uh, near Moffat Lake Road. Uh, the boys are in there today, started mobilizing in there, and they'll start digging tomorrow to have a gander at what's it. So when that pig ran through the pipe there, and uh, it came up with, hey, there's something here, we got to go check this out. So that's what they're doing. They're, they uh, depressurize the line, they go and expose the line, and see what it is. So they'll do scans, um, radiological scans from the outside, and that kind of stuff, and they'll clean all the coating off the pipe and just look to see what's, what's there. And this is part of that since our pipe broke in Shelly here, uh, part of that process of what we've been really intensifying on to get in there to make sure that everything is good. Uh, we do have uh, a couple of anode beds uh, that we're gonna be replacing. Now these are a piece of pipe buried in the ground that we put current to it. When that current is entered, it creates these um, magnetic fields in the ground and that helps to prevent corrosion on our pipes. So we've got two of them that we're going to, that are, that are still working, but not as working as efficiently as we like. So we're gonna get in there and replace them. One is on the Cornell Hickson Road, and the other is uh, Windit Road, south of Cornell. Uh, there was the old log house building place there. Uh, we're gonna go in there and replace that one also. Those are, are the main projects that we've got working on right now in the Cornell region. We have a number of other integrity digs that we're working on, but most of those currently are north of Prince George. Um, or near Prince George. So we'll be working on those here after we finish the ones down at Moffat Lake Road, uh, working our way north as the snow allows us to get into the pass. So that's roughly what we got going on. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ricky. Questions from council? I'm not seeing anybody signaling. Okay, so that's great. Uh, Jeff, what do you do with those big wood pallets that you're running your equipment over? Uh, I could think of a few things I could use that <laughs> for after your project. Rig mats. <laughs> they're, rig, they're rig mats. Yeah. Um, we actually don't own the rig mats. We rent oh, them. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're actually kind of expensive, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and all those rig mats, when they're moved from one location to another, they are completely cleaned. And if there's any kind of contaminant in them, they're not used again. So yeah. those 
this might be something that uh, uh, companies might be willing to release. But uh, yeah, are <laughs> pretty intense to make sure that we don't spread weeds from one place to another place. It includes the washing equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah it was just it was interesting because they're they're quite a size, right? And so there was a bit of a buzz as to what the heck was going on uh, okay. when they were laid uh, through. Uh, the uh, Heinzelman's property there to get into your site. So yep. uh, there was all kinds of stories about what was happening uh, there. So And what that does is it kind of makes like a bridge across the yep. pipe and it reduces any kind of pressure that we wind up putting on there. It just helps to protect the pipe. Yeah, perfect. Uh, no, no further questions from council. Go ahead, Ricky. It's not a really big bonfire. <laughs> no. yeah. so, so one of the, one of the things that we do come up with in, in our aerial patrol is the Canadian Energy Regulator requires us to see the ground directly over top of our pipe. We go through the backyards of a number of places through Cornell um, where people do have things in there and we're um, regularly talking to a number of different uh, residents that live through there and talking about, Kate, we need to just to shuffle this derelict vehicle over a little bit so that we can <clears> actually have a um, look at the ground to make sure that there are no concerns. So sometimes those type of things we wind up doing and Cornell yeah. is, that happens on occasion. Yeah, good. Well, thank you both. I think this is an important project for council to be aware of and some of the economic activity and some of the job uh, implications uh, for us. So I appreciate you both spending time with us this evening uh, and look forward, Ricky, to seeing you at uh, future meetings of the CRD. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay we'll, go, we'll go to our second uh, delegation and we have both uh, Miriam and Darren on. And I believe the best thing for you guys, A, is just to, similar to what Ricky just did and, and just walk through the presentation. Uh, and you've got uh, page numbers so you can just speak to each of uh, the slides. Does that work, Miriam? Um, yeah, that would work. I can quickly try to see if I can share the screen because I have a button for it. Okay, and I believe that Carrie just gave you uh, rights. Yeah. yeah, I think we've had those. So let me just let me know if this works here. Um, can you guys see? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, All right. There we go. Brilliant. So if you go to full screen on your end now. Yep. Yeah. There we go. We got it. Okay. Perfect. Well done. <clears throat> thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I guess for those that uh, we should quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Miriam Schilling. I'm the EDO at the Caribou Regional District. And I'm Darren Campbell. I'm the Community Services Manager with the CRD, and I, I work with Miriam on the economic development activities. Um, Miriam's going to do the presentation, but I wouldn't mind giving a little intro to it just briefly about where the labor market study came from. And in large part, a, a shout out to Amy Reed, who's also um, on, the, on the call or on the, the conference here. Amy and the other EDOs, including Miriam, um, had spoken regularly about what are some of the limiting factors in the region that are challenging us for economic development. And the ones that kept repeating themselves were labor market and housing and communications, broadband technology. So we, you know, we tried to say, okay, of all the other noise that's out there in economic development and of all the other opportunities that are out there, let's try and focus on progress on a couple of key things. And, and labor market quickly floated to the top about you know, the challenges businesses are facing around growth. Um, you know, that there are many, many successful businesses in the region and how do we help them be more successful? And whenever we spoke with them, that was one of the limiting factors that they continually brought up was access to, to the right labor, to the skilled labor, to the qualified labor, to the experienced labor. Um, so, you know, it, it was identified as a labor gap. Um, and, and this study was intended to identify uh, exactly where that gap was. I think what you'll find in the presentation, a, a lot of it is understood already anecdotally. This provides the, uh, the study to verify uh, what I think a, a lot of people already knew and a lot of businesses already knew about where those gaps are. Um, we did get funding for the project. Again, thanks in large part to, to Miriam, Amy, and Beth Veenkamp in particular at the City of Williams Lake through their contacts with the province. 
Um, so this study was 100% funded uh, with grant funding from the province. Uh, so I think that in and of itself was a, was a good benefit to the region. And, and I'm, I'm really happy with the results of it. And I think it gives us some clear direction going forward. So I'm, I'm really glad we're able to make this presentation to Quinnell Council tonight. And, and with that, I'll, I'll let Miriam go through the details. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so um, just, uh, just going to click through the slides here. Um, so basically, it is a project delivered through partnerships. Just I think it's really important to mention that it was, yes, we were the lead at the CRD, but it was totally a partnership between us, the municipalities of Quinell, Williams Lake, Hunter Mile House, and Wells, and also member communities of the Northern Sequim, Silcoteen, and Southern Carrier, Duck Hill First Nations. Um, and uh, we had a steering committee right from the beginning that oversaw all stages of the project. Uh, there was there was members of all those partners, um, part of that steering committee, including Amy, who, as Darren said, played a, a really important role in, in the whole project. And yeah, it was funded by the Government of Canada and the province of British Columbia. So just want to quickly go over the, the purpose and outcomes of the, the whole project. It was, you know, um, and, and basically, as Darren mentioned, it, it, it really started because of all the EDOs in the region constantly brought it up and 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 mentioned the need for for a formal study um, since there was so many businesses that had challenges um, finding the right um, yeah the right people to fill their positions so it really started from um, yeah from from those businesses who through their EDOs um, brought that uh, brought that need uh, forward so some of the purposes and outcomes are to ac access the current gaps and factors influencing recruitment, attraction efforts, and labor market participation, to um, explore potential for better recruitment from, from within the region, to assess effects of existing and potential factors influencing the regional labor market, such as demographics, environmental challenges like the pine beetle and wildfires, identify sectors with potential for growth and prospect for decline, access the existing image of the Caribou Chilcote region across Canada and then also to assess the barriers for instance housing or health services and opportunities of the regional labor force relative to provincial federal and global context to assess employers rating of the regional labor force so such as work ethic technical skills educational attainment professional skills and availability then to inform, engage, and collaborate with organizations and educational institutions such as WorkBC, CNC, UNBC, and TRU to better align programs with regional labor market needs. And also to identify any potential structural changes in the regional economy and subse subsequent effects in the regional labor market. So that's really just an overview um, of what the study um, was looking at and trying to, yeah, trying to find the right um, solutions to and, and I think the final bullet's an interesting point there the potential structural changes changes in the economy when when we first began the study and a lot of the data that was coming in was right when the uh, forest sector downturn and a lot of the mill curtailments and closures were happening and that really gave us some context for this labor market study because a lot of the data we were using and potentially going to analyze was was a bit dated and didn't recognize that so throughout the study, we had that lens to deal with that it said these are, you know, there may be through the data, a lot of opportunities in manufacturing, but for anybody that had read a newspaper in the last few months knew that that opportunity was probably not there anymore because of a lot of the forestry curtailments that were happening. So, you know, we were very alive to different issues that were happening in the region. Of course, the most current one with the, the global pandemic situation and, and COVID changing the way we do business, changing the challenges and the opportunities in business. Um, the study does recognize that those things happen and it's intended to be a snapshot in time, but it's also a living document that, you know, tries to be, tries to recognize the environment that it's happening in. Yeah, and I think it's a good time now to, to bring up uh, the COVID-19 um, sort of note on the whole project because obviously you know I mean one of our first reactions was when when everything started is now we might need a new study uh, but uh, but having said that you know we, we included a letter as you guys can see if you actually um, have the 
the, the, the whole document in front of you, the, the, the strategy. Uh, we included a letter recognizing the situation we're in. In some ways, I think it's, it's good. I think what happened to other communities is they were in the middle of this process when COVID hit. So at least we were able to complete this beforehand. So we have a clear, basically, assessment of the market, the labor market before COVID. And also, having said that, there's, there's a lot that will still be valid, probably, probably most of it, to be honest. Um, so it's, uh, it's obviously something we wanted to recognize, but, but I think we still have a really good, uh, um, yeah, a really good project outcome with what we've got here, but definitely wanted to recognize and, and we can speak a little bit more later about, about how we sort of addressed what's currently going on. Um, so yeah, the project outcome is basically those, uh, that, that, that final um, five year labor market strategy and you know, so it does, you know, supply plus demand is the alignment. Um, that's sort of the whole, <laughs> the nuts and bolts of it. And I'd like to mention as well, because I don't think that was included in you guys' package, but you can download it from the website. Um, we, or I should say the consultant together with, with the steering committee decided that it makes a lot of sense to have two documents. Basically, our, the main one where you see the, um, that you have as well. Um, is the main labor market strategy for the region. Um, and then there's a much larger document, which we call the technical document, that, that is for those that really want to dig in deeper. It has a lot more information on, um, yeah, all the technical research that was done. So um, whereas the, the actual strategy is, is manageable, it's not, it's, we didn't want that 200 page document that is not going to be a working document as much. So I think it makes a lot of sense if somebody wants to look in and dig deeper and find lots of maybe broken down by region or sub-regional stats, they're all there. Um, but as a working document, this, this final strategy is the document to use. On top of that, and we can have a quick look at that after this presentation, we've created a little infographic that is really that very brief overview. And for anybody brand new to the project, it gives, yeah, it gives a real quick overview of what, what the project is all about. So um, just, to, just to look into a little bit of, um, you know, what we've done throughout the whole process. Um, obviously, to get started, to start, if we did a whole lot of background research, we are, and, and the consultants, um, which a lot of that can be found in the technical document. Um, then there was a regional employer survey went out through various channels that uh, was completed by 220 employers. A job seeker survey completed by 191 people. There was a national perception survey. It was really good to add a lot of value with uh, about 800 people who completed that. Um, we identified or the steering committee identified a few key informants who, who did interviews uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And we also hosted education roundtables because of that. There's that really important link between economic development and the education sector, which was attended by 29 people. Both those sessions were hosted in Cornell and then also Williams Lake. But we had people from Kamloops, from TRU, travel specifically because um, they, they clearly saw the, the need to, to attend and were quite interested. Um, and then I also should mention, once we did all those... Um, you know, we did all that research here and basically came up with, with, uh, with our draft sort of findings. Um, another really important piece we, we added was uh, validation sessions. Those were, were hosted in also Quinella, Williams Lake and 100 Mile House. We had almost 50 people in total attend those. And the idea was to, to um, basically have, I mean, we didn't want to do the study, you know, and interview a lot of people, get their input. And um, we wanted to make sure to go back to those people and say, did we, did we get it? Did we hear you right? Um, now's your chance to, to sort of let us know if there's something missing. Maybe we, yeah, maybe we just didn't, um, you know, miss something here. So, so it was, I think it was really good as the final sort of the community engagement to do those sessions. And I'll go over a few highlights right now. I won't, you know, we, we don't want to spend two hours on this. So I'll just highlight a few things that were interesting from the regional employer survey and the job seeker survey. 
um, as well as a little bit just so you guys get an idea about um, the background research that was done. So this is just an, an example and there's a lot more stats for you know anybody who wants to dig into this. Um, community profile is just a good example and it also shows how we um, broke down <clears throat> the region into the subregions. It was important to have it as a regional study, um, but um, especially, I mean, obviously from the municipal EDOs and, and it made sense to sort of look at our subregions just to see is there differences. So we, you know, this is just showing the, um, the census data and population growth, but it's an example of how we split the region. Um, we have the whole, the whole area, the first column, and then, for instance, Quenelle is, is, can be looked at individually. So can the North Caribou, Central Caribou, um, Urban is basically Williams Lake. And then we have Central Caribou Division Rural, which is really the Chilcotin as well as likely Horsefly area. And then the, the South Caribou as well. And then it does compare it to BC. So a lot of our, um, different stats are broken down by those subregions. So this is a good example of uh, um, the job postings, um, or basically to, just basically to show the gaps that we see in, in the industry, which I'm sure a lot of that is not really a total surprise to anybody. I mean, it's a lot of things we, we technically heard about lots and kind of already knew, um, but the way this was this was done. It basically looked at job search sites online and compared the number of job postings by the job seekers. And it clearly shows the large, large gaps in healthcare and social assistance. Retail trade has a bit of a gap the other way, manufacturing. Um, so so yeah, it really shows that that there's some areas that, that really, really have huge gaps with way more jobs posted than, um, than people um, that are out there. So jump to the next one. So our business survey, there's a few key findings um, or we've asked um, the businesses, what barriers do you encounter in recruiting, hiring and retaining employees? So lack, just simply lack of qualified candidates with 74% was was by far the biggest issue that was brought up, that there's just not enough people or the right people that are applying for jobs. And then with, with the other ones here, as, as you can see on the slide. Um, another bit of the, like, the key findings from our business survey, um, the ones to, to really highlight here too is, is basically the ones at the bottom, you know, where, where there's, um, well, the question was how satisfied are you with the following policy or planning areas that as they pertain to the health of your business and availability of rental, residential rental accommodations played a huge, huge um, impact or was a huge, you know, in, 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 in them being able to find people and then back to availability of skilled labor and, uh, and on and on from there. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see what, what businesses find challenging and, um, and obviously all of those stats, now we're looking at regional data, but, but if you wanted to look at sub-regional breakdowns of all of those, that can all be found in the, in the technical report. A few highlights from the job seeker survey. So this was people that were um, um, basically either unemployed or underemployed at, at the moment. Um, you know, it gives a bit of background of who, who those people were. Um, like, you know, different, different professions here. Um, so what's interesting here, and there's always sort of that little bit of a gap, one of the biggest challenges identified by the job seekers was they, they said there is no high quality jobs in my field. So here we have on the one side, the businesses that say we don't have qualified people and the job seeker is saying um, there aren't enough high quality jobs. Um, so that's apparently very common. Um, but, um, but it's still interesting to note that, you know, to see that there's that disconnect. Um, and, um, and then another one that's interesting as well is that um, job seekers didn't find that there was a lot of uh, employment assistance services, which, you know, which could be in some ways, yeah, could be questioned to see if they just don't know who those are or just aren't aware of the services that they might have available to them. Because it seems like we do have uh, we do have quite a bit, but 
but yeah, it just shows a bit of that disconnect. So another bit of the, the key findings from the job seeker surveys, just basically they were asked of factors that are hindering me in getting a job or a better job. And um, yeah, it came up again. So people said a lack of suitable job opportunities or lack of adequately paying jobs. And then the next thing was um, lack of accessibility to relevant training and education. And then it goes, goes on from there, but those are some of the highlights that we thought we'd mention here. So that, that um, already brings us to basically the, the findings or the, the, the strategic pillars, objectives, and actions that came out of the study. Um, you know, and I'd just like to spend a few minutes to go over those, just, uh, um, just you know, to really focus on the results of the study. Um, and um, so it was split into three pillars, basically, the strategic pillars. One was labor market intelligence, um, under which we have objective one and two. You know, one is increase current labor market knowledge and literacy. Two is disseminate and communicate relevant data. Um, the second pillar is educate, train, retain. So that's increase access to training and reskilling opportunities. Objective four is alignment of education sector with local needs. Increase workforce readiness and soft skills among the local workforce. And then barrier resolution and strategic enhancements. Um, then we have cultivate and grow with um, yeah, increased labor market participation. Objective eight is grow the region's economy. Objective nine is build assets and promote the region. And under those um, objectives, we have a total of 40 actions. Um, I did list them all here and depending on time, I think we could just really quickly go through them or I can just, um, you know, it, maybe we'll, uh, we'll try to highlight a couple of them real quick here. Um, but uh, yeah, it basically shows, I think it's almost quite a few. I, I try to, I'll try to not take all the time by going, going into those unless you think we should, but. No, just summaries. Yeah, I think summaries yeah. are probably fine. And I mean, they are, mm -hmm. you know, on the next, the next couple slides really just, uh, just focus on those actions. And I think rather than going over all of them, um, you know, it's, it's clearly broken down under objective one. We have three action items, you know, to use as examples. Um, what I'll do maybe real quick is I'll go, I'll go through them and identify the ones that, that the steering committee looked at basically here a few weeks ago. We had another call um, and, uh, and, and tried to identify which ones are, are the ones that we really need to focus on now with, with our current situation that we're in. Um, one that stood out was under objective five um, to produce resources that identifies training providers and contact information to really help people right now that are looking for work to, um, to look at both training and contact information. I mean, to, to, uh, you know, to be able to enter the workforce or maybe perhaps change direction a little bit. Um, another one that the steering committee highlighted is under objective eight. Um, is to assess the rural broadband gaps, especially with a lot of people working from home. It seems more important than ever to, to really try to address that one. Um, also to develop tech worker and entrepreneur attraction strategy. So this also fits into this whole trend of more and more people working from home. Um, and perhaps with that, also attracting new people into the region that can potentially bring their jobs with them. Um, so, so that's that's a point in itself too. And then under objective nine, um, to initiate a regional economic development website, which we're, we, we are currently working on as we speak. So those are some of the highlights that we were identified as, um, or the basically that got bumped in their priority um, to, be, to be tackled right away. So that basically is the presentation in a nutshell. I think what I'd like to do, and I'll just quickly try to see if I can how I can switch and share the infographic. So we have that on the screen for a few minutes. I'll stop share for a second and share again and find this one right here. So hopefully this one's working. And what we wanted to do with this was to create a few pages of take home conclusions. 
about, you know, the study itself is, is 200 pages of surveys and data mining. The technical, doc, technical document is more than that. You know, it, it's, but we wanted enough of an understanding of what was done, where it was done, how, and what the results were. We wanted a real summary document that we could use for presentations like this or reaching out to those key stakeholders like the education roundtables or the ongoing uh, economic development roundtables or engaging with industry and industry representatives. We really wanted to have all of that work summarized into a very short digestible document. And this is what we came up with. So I think, you know, if, if you have to really pay close attention to any piece of this, this is the one where we're hoping you'll be able to, to take home and understand. Yeah, so just if we wanted to quickly go over the infographic, which I think you guys have a copy of as well, and they're, they're on our website too. The first page is really sort of given that overview about what, what did we do, um, who did we talk to, um, and obviously recognizing our partners and funders. And uh, the second page is, is really, you know, highlighting some of those key findings from the study. Um, so that's always an interesting one to, you know, to use. And, um, and the third page um, has some of the key um, actions that came out of the study. But, you know, the second page seems to be the one that, um, that really has some of the, you know, very interesting um, facts that, that, uh, that we pulled out. So um, with that, and, you know, I mean, we could go over some of those, but I, I think it would be good to see if anybody has questions to any, um, yeah. any piece of the study or any any of the, the findings. Thanks, Miriam. And if you could uh, unshare so that uh, we can see oh. the big heads back to the Brady Bunch right. uh, grouping. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, I think that was uh, very helpful. Uh, so council, uh, a comprehensive uh, presentation was given at the CRD with one of the consultants involved. I think Miriam's done a great job of condensing that uh, for us tonight. And as she and Darren have indicated, the full report is available to you if you want to get down uh, deeper uh, into some of the numbers and especially some of the sub-regional numbers. Uh, in the discussion at the CRD, you know, some of the things that uh, have come out that that gap between job seekers uh, saying that there weren't jobs there available for them at the rate of pay. It's pretty hard to come out of your Nintendo man cave uh, or woman cave or whatever cave uh, and get a $40 an hour job doing nothing. Uh, and so some of the skills gap uh, is represented in a misalignment uh, between both individuals uh, training and background and their expectations for remuneration. Uh, that's clearly uh, part of what's going on. If you look at uh, the such sector, there's, you know, the social services, education, health sector, uh, where there's a huge misalignment between the job seekers and the available jobs. It shows a, a kind of a shift in your economy uh, towards uh, much more trained jobs. Uh, MCFD here will tell you they've had three uh, child-related social services positions open. I think they're going in the third or fourth year. Uh, fully funded positions. They just can't get qualified people uh, to go after them. And there's examples of that throughout that sector. And then the other one that's interesting in here is on the retail uh, side as well. Uh, and a lot of people will tell you that that's a function of, you know, some lacks of interpersonal skills, lack of, of kind of uh, work ethic, uh, things like that, that cause some real grief in terms of people's expectations, aspirations for the job and the employer's desire for the kind of person and the frontline person that they want in the job. So, uh, you know, the, the data shows us one thing, but as Miriam said at the beginning, we, we have anecdotal uh, and experiential information that also flavors what we're seeing in front of us. I think the key thing for us, and it would be interesting to do some kind of post-COVID uh, piece, the interesting thing for us is we keep hearing 
uh, this business of there are no jobs, there are no jobs, there are no jobs. What the labor market shows is there are jobs, there's a misalignment uh, of, of skill set, expectations, et cetera, uh, and fewer job seekers than jobs. Uh, there's, it's a misalignment issue more than anything else. So, uh, Councillor Paul, I think I saw your hand up. Uh, thank you, and um, special hello to you, Miriam. Um, we go back a long way with um, at our seat on the new Pathways to Gold table, so good to see you again. Um, I have um, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I'll say that the, the report is uh, very well researched and presented. A lot, of inf a lot of useful information in there. However, I would ask whether the template that you used um, is unique only to the Caribou Chilcotin region or um, can it be uh, strategically uh, matched and compared to other regions in BC? And I do have one other question. So, so with template, um, is that you're referring to the surveys or the questions that were asked or, or the, the template of the whole strategy? I'm, I'm, I'm referring to both actually. And I, I would think, I mean, to, to try to answer that a bit, I think um, there's obviously some some questions and as well as, I mean, the whole the whole um, um, structure of the reports that that could be used in other regions, obviously. But but having said that, um, the steering committee did review um, the questions of the survey and, and basically was part of the whole process in working with the consultants. So I think there was as much focus as possible to really um, keep it relevant to our region um, because because yes some some things are obviously different in other areas um, the, the one thing that made it a bit of a challenge is to find i mean looking especially looking at the background research when looking at stats canada data is that it just isn't as current as we always want it to be right so um, the data we had available was was from before the wildfires which is, that's, I mean, that's really the best we could, we could work with or we had to work with. So those, those are obvious limitations, um, I think, that we got to recognize. Um, but it's, it's pretty tough. Um, yeah, you know, we can't quite duplicate Stats Canada data. And I mean, even there within that, I mean, there's, there's, there's once in a while there was glitches that we found. But by having that steering committee with representatives from from those partners throughout the region. I think we, we did our best and really trying to keep it as relevant as possible to our region, um, if, that, if that answers it a bit. And I, again, as far as the whole structure, it was, I mean, again, it, 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 it sort of, I think it was a good mix and having the expertise from the consultant and their you know, years and years of uh, background um, knowledge when it comes to these kind of projects. And then back to, again, the steering committee who, who would always say, hey, but how about us in the Caribou? We know this is, this is what's important to us, so. And and I'll add yeah. briefly to that, Ron, that certainly some of the conclusions are comparative. Um, when we interviewed the consultant that did the work for us, MDB Insights, one of the reasons they got the job is they had just completed a similar exercise for the Baltimore to Chaco Regional District. And so I quizzed them on, okay, if you've done this already, you know, in advance of us even doing it, what were some of the conclusions that you came up with? And before we'd even conducted our study, the number one conclusion out of the Baltimore to Chaco was that same connection of stay in school, that there, there is a post-secondary expectation for the workforce that particularly I think northern regions are lacking in and it's that you know across the board employers of all shapes and sizes are looking for post-secondary education it doesn't always have to be a university degree a college degree it can be certificates it can be you know training specific they're willing to train in some cases but that was a consistent comparative from another region um, that you know came out before we even started this study so there's definitely some comparables. Uh, thank you, Darren. And just supplementary to that, um, uh, that was going to be my next question was um, uh, if, the, if the consultant had, uh, had done similar studies in other regions, and you, you kind of answer that. Uh, the second question that I have is um, when was the information that, that um, are, is contained within this report, when was it obtained and compiled? And the reason I'm asking is that 
um, if it was compiled before COVID um, and you were to conduct the same exercise now, do you feel that the, the information and, uh, and outcomes would be um, significantly changed? So, Councillor Paul, just to note, that was mentioned explicitly at the very beginning of the presentation. This, this labour market analysis was done before COVID and Miriam explicitly mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, if anything, it just gives us a benchmark. So, uh, asked and answered within the presentation, uh, Councillor Paul. And if, I can, uh, so, if I can quickly speak to that, I think, um, yeah. I think one thing I'd like to note, obviously, if we did surveys right now with both businesses and, and uh, job seekers, like right now as we speak, they, yes, they would be totally different. Um, but yeah. I don't know if that would even, I mean, and there is such surveys being done by various groups just to assess and find out where's everybody at right now. But I don't know if this would be a time, it, I don't think personally it would be a time to conduct a study like that. It, would, it might be after the fact, it's no different with wildfire situations, right? Like it, when you're in the middle of it all, which we kind of still are, even though we're slowly, slowly trying to, you know, enter that recovery phase, I think, if we want to call it that. Um, it, it would be fair to do it a few months from now when whatever the new normal is, when we're sort of back to that. Um, but I don't think anything would compare to the situation right now as it is. So, um, and, and as, you know, and again, as, um, as we've uh, sort of stated at the beginning, I, it seems like reviewing um, sort of, I think it was a few weeks back that we did review um, the, the action items with the steering committee just for that specific reason to look at has anything really shifted and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like it. The only thing that shifted slightly was maybe the priorities to say this one item was kind of put down as a medium term, you know, um, looking at the next couple of years and it's, you know, we, we, we sort of said, no, this is something that's relevant now. So that is maybe a little bit of a shift, but but the data didn't drastically, or the I don't think it drastically changed. We still need childcare, we still need housing, like looking at some of those key messages. Um, we and both of those we knew beforehand, but but I think this provides sort of the background um, data to to confirm um, to confirm those. Yeah, thank you, you Councillor Rudenberg. Can I just respond, Councillor Rudenberg, please. Go ahead, Councilor Thank Rupert. you. Thank you. Um, so I uh, appreciate the presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Darren and Miriam. Uh, my question, I guess, um, and I, I totally agree. I think that if you were to do this right now, the some of the uh, outcomes would be a little skewed because of where people's priorities are and they're thinking about the here and now and what's going on with their jobs or their businesses. Um, so do we see, um, perhaps this goes towards our own staff, being able to use these outcomes and this action plan, this summary, as um, that uh, alignment that we can use to enhance our economic recovery and stimulus discussion? Because I look at some of these um, pieces and there are bits and pieces in there that we could pull out that would strengthen any discussion we have with higher levels of government. So, you know, we talk about the education piece and et cetera. There are real opportunities here to take bits and pieces, if not all of this, and to enhance our discussion at the higher levels of government when we talk about economic recovery. Yeah, and so Councillor Rudenberg, as uh, Miriam and Darren have indicated, Amy Reed, our EDO, has been heavily involved in this. Uh, so, and Amy, I see you pop on here. Uh, and the other piece, of course, it, you're right, uh, you know, that education and training piece. So we've already uh, given approval, for example, for two major education programs through the forest training, uh, forest uh, uh, think tank uh, process. Uh, with CNC that are partly derivative of the kind of data sets uh, that we're getting here. Uh, and I just saw an email today about another potential training initiative that's coming out. So uh, without question, uh, as we action uh, this strategy, uh, it becomes part of our entire transition strategy. Um, Amy, do you want to comment? Sure, yeah. I think that, um, like Miriam and Darren said, some of the 
the things that came out of the strategy weren't surprises. It just confirmed things that we already knew. But when you've got it in a document that was completed by a third party, then it just gives extra weight to any grants that we're, we're applying for um, and just backs up that we're on the right track with some of the things that we already have in our economic development transition strategy as well. Thank you. Right on. Thank you. Other comments from councillors? Councillor Runch. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, uh, Miriam and uh, Darren. Those a great, a great report. I've got a couple of questions. Well, one of them is actually that something, you know, as a council, looking at that 53% or 51% of people that, uh, you know, businesses that are uh, questioning development building permit process, that's something we can possibly look at and see, mm -hmm. uh, have to dig deeper into the report. But the, the question I have is uh, relative to the key informants. Uh, you know, given that, you know, the data was taken from a really quite a large region with, you know, a, a large number of partners, were, were each of those informants or those key informants, did they, were they representative of each area or like, because I didn't look at the big report, but, you know, I was trying to find out who those people were. They were representative of the whole regions. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for us to share names um, outside of sort of the steering committee. Mm -hmm. um, but also another thing that, that I think I can mention is, the, and the report has a section to highlight sort of the results from, from those interviews, but, but we also found um, they really just confirmed all the findings. Like there wasn't anything drastically brand new that, that um, just came from those key informants. I think that's important to know. They were really great in confirming basically all the other work that had been done. Um, so, so it was definitely valuable, but um, yeah, I think, um, to hope, hope that answers the questions. I think we did have a very good representation as, as much as we could and um, for being a large region, but yeah, you know, hope that, hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. And Councillor Runge, just uh, before you go down the rabbit hole of business development permit processes, uh, pretty much everybody gets hammered with that. And 90% of any investigations that have been done on that, it's predominantly the proponent doesn't take the time to actually understand the process uh, and reserves the right to complain. Uh, you really, and we're, we're doing some marginal work about how we can make things cleaner and clearer and so on. But for the most part, it's that differentiation between the province's building code and you know building inspection and the permitting process and all that stuff uh, that it's just an easy kind of scapegoat for lots of, of folks. So uh, don't go down the rabbit hole too deep, I don't think is what I'm saying. Councillor Vic. The satisfaction level with that uh, section was actually quite high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Miriam and Darren. That was really great. Uh, this is just a great mind to, that I'm sure we'll keep on giving as we dig deeper. Um, I just, uh, uh, one, one section, uh, or perhaps as part of your objective and actions, uh, one thing that caught my ear was uh, the recognition that there's a, an untapped resource in convincing um, people in major urban centers to come uh, work anywhere and live in Quinnell or live in, live in the region. And I'm curious if, if that uh, exact notion has made it into part of this uh, uh, objectives and action section. That's my first question. Yeah, and I think um, it's interesting because I think what hasn't made it into the report is because basically it was finalized in, in, in March and, and then finally we sort of released, released now March, April, I should say. But one thing that um, just looking at, looking at the news and different articles that are that are out right now with our current situation, it seems like there's never been more interest in rural areas than now yeah. with, with the whole idea of self-isolation, people working from home. Um, and we've seen that in different articles, um, you know, news articles floating around, including those from realtors that say we've never seen higher interest in rural properties. And, and even again, sometimes directly on the, on the, on the EDO calls that we have, well, we hear that people people find out that uh, or hear about um, families or individuals wanting to move to to our municipalities to our region um, and again sometimes a lot of times they bring their jobs or you know an example i mean a lot of but what happens too is one person might be working remotely already and the other one might try to look for a job but you know the spouse and 
And um, so there's, uh, you know, I think it wasn't totally captured as far as how much of that is currently happening because, um, you know, I think, I think uh, a lot of us have always, who live here, have always known how great this region is and how much we appreciate this lifestyle. But I think now more than ever are people realizing that it's, yeah, more fun to live somewhere where you have, where you have the opportunity to have a backyard and, and um, a lot of uh, opportunities for recreation and you're not, um, you're not basically stuck in an apartment somewhere. So it, it is really interesting and, 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 and we're curious to see, you know, what happens with that if people are, if that, if that's going to stay like that and the interest or the interest is just short lived, it's hard to say, right? But, but that's just what a lot of us are currently seeing out there. Well, I think even with the current COVID situation where many of us have been compelled to work from home, I think it may even illustrate the advantage of being able to work uh, remotely and live wherever you like. So if anything, that could be a, a very small silver lining in this situation we find ourselves. And sorry, just one last, uh, just, just, just for my own interest, I'm curious, can you elaborate on what the National Perception Survey entailed and, and what, what, what that all about was about? Yeah, so I mean, it was, it was basically, the, the, this was a survey that wasn't done in the region here so much. It was done throughout all of Canada. Um, and, um, you know, what, uh, a few interesting facts, I think one of them is on page two of the infographic, um, you know, was basically the idea was to find out how familiar are people with our region. And then also looking at different different factors. Again, I could look at I could quickly look at the the study to, to pull out some examples. But but one of them would be I remember one question that we highlighted in the infographic was um, if for the same rate of compensation, how what is your likelihood to move into let's say our region? And and the provinces that that was highest, you know, I think was Ontario. Um, Quebec and Manitoba, if I remember correctly, without looking at it. So those those are examples where it could be useful if, if again, us as a region or individual municipalities would like to, um, you know, would like to specifically target um, do, through job fairs or even ads or whatever it might be. Um, those are the areas to maybe focus on that already have a higher willingness to relocate here. So it was really trying to do that kind of background research, you know, like what uh, another example could be, if, have, again, just simply asking, have you heard about this region? And if you did, what, what comes to mind? Like what, what are the things that, that the caribou is known for? Um, and, that, and that's really where yeah. it, it started, Mitch, is it was, we wanted to know what our image was, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, and the next obvious step. And I think your first point was bang on. We are, and we're already moving in that direction is we need to create awareness of the region across BC and across Canada. So we really wanted to know where we were starting from. Do, are people even aware of where the caribou is? Could you find someone in a smaller community in Ontario and get them to point on a map? where the caribou is and they can't like you know i think that was you know there there isn't a huge awareness of the caribou region in a lot of other parts of the province let alone the country so you know i think we what the positives that came out of that though was that we're a part of bc and nationally bc has a very high rating of people that would like to live here it has a very good image so i think when we're looking at retention and attraction strategies we're starting from a much better place than many other parts of the country. You know, it, you know, if you were comparing us as, you know, the competitors for trying to draw talent and entrepreneurs to an area, um, I, I think we're starting out from a very strong position and we need to capitalize that when we're developing our retention and attraction strategies. Uh, and, and that's really what we were trying to achieve is, is what does the rest of the country and the province think of us? What do they know about us? And how can we uh, improve that and maximize on it? Great, thank you. Um, we do have a long agenda and uh, I'm looking for first time. Okay, Councillor Paul. Yeah, just very quickly, I just want to make it clear that I indeed have read the report. In fact, I don't have a lot, whole lot of other things to do at this time. And I noted the, the limited comment on COVID at the outset. And thank you, Marian, Miriam, for your detailed uh, response. And I too agree that it would not be useful if the survey and the compilation of the material uh, were to be undertaken at this time. I just wanted to make that clear. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Darren and Miriam. Uh, great uh, presentation of a very substantive uh, document and report. And I appreciate you taking questions from council. And thanks for sure. uh, struggling through getting on uh, as well. It was great to have you in person uh, on the Brady Bunch screen in front of us here. Uh, thanks. We'll move on to our agenda now. Thanks all. Thanks. Okay, with respect to committee reports, Public Safety and Policing Committee, very quickly, as you'll see, very uh, short report. Uh, we basically had a roundtable discussion just about what we were seeing, if anything, uh, with respect uh, to any kind of COVID-related uh, policing or public safety uh, issues, uh, in part stimulated by a query from the school district on our um, uh, EOC calls, our stakeholder call, uh, with respect to any uptick uh, that could be potentially reported on uh, family violence situations, child abuse situations, et cetera. Uh, we can't get into any of those details other than in an anecdotal form. Uh, and anecdotally, the RCMP at the time that we had the meeting indicated that they were not seeing anything they would consider substantive in terms of reportables or, uh, or reported incidents. Uh, we did have a discussion about what we were seeing out on the street, uh, and it was felt at that time uh, that we should share with Council uh, the uh, bylaw uh, update reports that we were getting, uh, and again, uh, that action was taken. So uh, that's really all uh, that we had to do. It was just a touch base as part of the provincial state of emergency and, and as a result of our stakeholder uh, EOC conversations. Uh, and we're waiting uh, now for uh, some things to solidify before we have a more formal uh, public safety uh, and policing committee meeting. And I believe we're looking at June uh, sometime. Uh, the one thing that did come out of uh, this was that uh, our two person prolific offenders team uh, is having very good success. Uh, it is uh, staffed by two long-term uh, Quinnell uh, detachment members who are senior individuals uh, and who are also uh, very committed uh, to the community kind of long-term in terms of their own uh, career pathing. Uh, and our staff sergeant uh, basically indicated these, he thinks he's got the right two people uh, consistently staffed and it's allowing us to deal with this prolific offender issue, which of course uh, should knock back uh, a lot of the uh, repeat offender type issues that we experience in our community. If I could comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. So just one comment about the prolific offenders. One of the interesting things that we're doing is tracking the uh, stats for the cases solved by those officers separately. And the benefit of that is then council after a certain period of time will be able to say, okay, we ponied up for, for two new officers. What are we getting out of that? And we'll be able to track that information. So I think that's quite useful. Yeah, and I think we're already seeing the impact on the flip side on the bylaw addition uh, and the capacity. And I just uh, was, uh, did an update for Rotary uh, last week uh, and uh, got really good feedback uh, from Sandra and a couple of others on uh, you know, what's happening with our bylaw uh, and how effective they are at being uh, in the downtown core and in problematic areas and the timeliness of the response. So we've committed in 2021 as part of our strategic plan uh, to do a review of the additional enforcement uh, personnel that we've deployed. And so the data that we're collecting uh, we'll have in front of council to be able to uh, take a look at that strategically. Uh, with that, uh, again, we don't need to receive uh, the, uh, this, it's just an update uh, report. Uh, so we'll, uh, if there's any questions, Councillor Runge. Not a question, just a quick thank you to Tanya for uh, always providing those reports. I don't always email back a thank you, but publicly here, thanks for sending them out to us. Okay. Thanks. I just want to make sure I say that Dell does most of that work, so I'm just doing a forward. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on then, policy and bylaw. Councillor Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just, you know, I, I agree with the comments that you made about uh, the downtown and seeing the differences. Um, yeah, it's been great. So this is an update on uh, policy and bylaw, our last meeting. Um, we're working 
obviously a lot on, on the housing front. Um, and one of the challenges that we're, we're coming up against, as everyone I'm, I'm sure should be aware, is the cost of construction in our area. And it's a real challenge. We talk often about if you build it, they will come. It, the challenge is getting to be able to build it. Because even if you go to Prince George, the cost of, of building um, anything is, is a lot cheaper there, never mind the lower mainland. So um, we're working on that to try and find some solutions, uh, dealing with the uh, developers and trying to get as much information out there. And it's all, it's all kind of COVID related, right? There were a lot of, um, there were a lot of information sessions and things that were gonna take place and everything's, everything's been put on hold. So still a lot of work to do, trying to overcome those challenges. Um, there's an, an opportunity for us to work in a partnership with the uh, UNBC and some of the students on a four-year program uh, to look at uh, a couple of different sites in the city to see how they might be designed um, for future development. And that could be a, a tool that's used down the road too to, to um, you know, help enhance the area and, and show the developers what's, uh, what's possible. Um, accessory buildings, you're all aware we've been working a lot on that. Uh, we need to do some more community outreach and you know once again a uh, broken record the COVID thing we'll get back into that uh, we're in need of and working on uh, Lindsay is working on specifically uh, the housing update so what that's all about is we've we've had housing reports over the last few years our last one obviously was the most extensive but we want to make sure that we're not missing anything from the previous reports so just tying everything in together um, and yeah, making sure that any gaps that were back 15 years are being discussed now too, so that we're not um, reinventing the wheel and things like that, right? Uh, solid waste and collection, there's been, we have to get a bit more stringent on the timing of uh, when people are putting out their garbages. They've, you know, I've been seeing the bears out there now, so that's, that's a work in play. So we'll go right to the recommendation sheets. Um, I've talked about basically so uh, on the first one all of those points and I'll just uh, read out the recommendation and it was moved by Mayor Simpson and seconded by Councillor Goulet and resolved that the policy and bylaw committee recommends to the council for the city to staff to work with the University of Northern British Columbia on a mock development for city lands and that council directs city staff to identify lands that could be put for a request for proposal for development and that council approves the following housing initiatives proposed by the housing planner to proceed the umbc partnership the accessory dwelling uh, unit outreach accessory dwelling unit workshop and the housing progress update report and i would move that recommendation seconder okay. councillor goulet any questions or comments Anyone opposed? Sorry, sorry, anyone sorry, opposed? Sorry. Okay, go ahead. That most that uh, recommendation is passed as a motion. Sure, and then thank you. And then back to the solid waste collection and disposal bylaw amendment. Moved, Council uh, Mayor Simpson and seconded Councillor Goulet, and resolved that the policy and bylaw committee recommends to council to adopt the policy to restrict placing residential garbage cans out overnight, and that a fifty dollar fine be placed in the municipal ticketing information bylaw for garbage carts placed outside of the hours of 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. on applicable resi residential garbage collection days and I would move that recommendation. So I think on this one, uh, Councillor Alley, because it's on the agenda tonight, we can just take this as information because the timing is such that uh, we're actually going to deal with the, the matter on the council agenda tonight. Yes, fair enough. Okay. And then uh, the second one, or the other one here, uh, moved Mr. Uh, by the mayor and second council Goulet and resolved that policy and bylaw committee recommends the following direction for city staff reg regarding the uh, following proposed amendments to the master zone bylaw. Um, and that's uh, prohibit remove uh, yeah. modular home. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, did you just, say something? Yeah, the last one uh, are, will, uh, they're just, Sorry, these are best uh, positioned as info only. Yep. Just because, because are coming there will forward. be a yep. report coming forward. Yeah. Yep. So absolutely, okay. and the same with the last one with the building yeah. permit fees. Yeah. Okay. okay. So just uh, for information. Yeah, and on the solid waste one, we'll deal with it tonight. Council Paul. Yep. Yes, thank you. I, I apologize for going back, but you didn't see my hand. Um, 
but regarding the, the $50 uh, municipal ticketing information, is there any way, because obviously this, this is brought about by the, the problem of, of bears. And I'm wondering, is this something that could be seasonal um, so that uh, people would be allowed to put their garbage out um, earlier in the morning? And I'm thinking particularly of shift workers. But it's coming tonight, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, so Council Paul, I've already indicated Report K3 is the actual report. So we will deal with that issue in the actual report. This is just a report from PABCOM indicating that something was coming forward. We just have an alignment issue where the something that's gonna come forward is actually on the agenda. So we'll get into the substance of your question when we hit that agenda item. Okay. Okay. Any other kind of questions, just in terms of the general direction that PABCOM has given to staff? Okay, seeing none, then again, uh, thank you, Councillor Elliott, uh, for the update. Uh, and I appreciate the continued work of PABCOM. We've got some work coming forward that we'll be able to dig into some of the items here. Uh, with respect to Financial Sustainability and Audit Committee, uh, effectively, uh, we've had a couple of conversations, one uh, at the direction of council uh, around our budget. We've had some conversations around possibilities to uh, tweak the tax stabilization reserve to take into consideration the tax and community stabilization uh, along the lines of what council was indicating. Uh, should we have uh, some overage, COVID-related overage this year, or if we wanna make a, a, a bit of a stronger adaptation uh, on the community side of the stabilization account. So staff, uh, FSAC's had the conversation, staff is gonna do some of the work and bring a report back to FSAC, which we'll fine tune and bring uh, to council. Uh, we also acted as the parcel tax review panel. Uh, there were a couple of minor adjustments uh, due to queries of the actual frontage uh, that uh, individuals uh, had. Uh, but uh, nothing uh, that was uh, calling into question uh, the, the actual uh, frontage tax. And so uh, the FSAC, which acted as the parcel tax review panel, uh, did uh, pass uh, that the um, frontage tax review um, uh, for the number that you see in here. Now, just a question. Well, that, that comes, right? It doesn't need to come. No. Doesn't need to come as a. It's just the, the parcel tax review panel does all the work, yeah. right? Okay, thank you. Uh, we also take a look at the four-year tax strategy that we developed prior to COVID. Uh, we, there are some moving pieces, uh, but we decided to wait until June to kind of firm that up a little bit and to bring something to council if we needed to, uh, because as we approach the end of June, it'll be some of the fine tuning work of the current FSAC because in the fall, uh, we'll be changing the membership of the standing committees as we hit our two year uh, mark. Uh, and then finally, uh, we did have a, a conversation about some issues around commercial cardboard. And so commercial cardboard, as with all recycling, uh, is becoming problematic. Uh, this one in particular, uh, they're pretty substantive handling fees. There's not a market for it, although potentially there may be some, uh, but we don't know. Uh, and so it does look like we're going to have to make some structural changes and fee changes uh, to deal with issues related to commercial cardboard. Uh, finance had a conversation with staff about that, uh, and staff is going to bring back a report uh, to council around uh, what will need to take place there to address the issue of commercial cardboard. So uh, just a heads up for you that uh, we will have to change our handling practices and what we do with that particular uh, recycling stream. Okay, any questions on the finance committee uh, report? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we'll move to executive committee, Councilor Rudenberg. Thank you. So you have before you a report from our May 6th uh, executive committee. Um, under summary, you'll note, note we have a standard report that will be coming from city manager Johnson on a moving forward basis that discusses upcoming community engagement. Um, feel your pain, Councillor Elliott, about being able to host your community outreach for your various um, objectives. But understanding that COVID-19 is kind of putting a halt to most of our um, 
our community engagement pieces. So you'll notice two, in, uh, two specific examples. The annual employee talks have been stood down for 2020, as has the West Quinnell Land Stability Community Meeting. Uh, next up is um, there was a discussion with Director Turner in regards to our Elliott Street housing project. We talked about uh, the creation of a community action committee that's being set up to help manage the Elliott Street development. It's not taking away from the good neighbor agreement and the accountability that will be going with that. Um, we also discussed uh, that we'll be requesting BC Housing and the Shelter Society to appear as a delegation to Council to discuss operations of the new facility with, and ongoing shelter operations. So this will give Council an opportunity to ask some poignant questions around what operations looks like at the new facility, things like resident uh, selection, the application process, the operating model, etc. Um, and also they even ask questions such as, you know, is there going to be any kind of special care for homeless seniors? Uh, there have been some specific concerns related to the existing shelter. And so hopefully those can be answered when we have them come as a delegation. Under business support strategies, um, as most of you um, know, uh, you've been getting the uh, uh, stats from Amy uh, on an ongoing basis weekly about who's been called, how many people have been touched base with, etc. Um, that business hotline, support hotline is moving into our, the next phase later on this week. Um, economic development will continue to work with these businesses to determine their biggest needs and potential solutions. Um, even things such as the provisions of PPE and other safety measures, those are ch significant challenges to our businesses right now. And I know that there is discussion underway in how um, the city can help move that challenge forward and support all our local businesses. And also city manager will be talking with the uh, with CAO McLean from the CRD and see if they would like to participate in our various business support strategies moving forward. Last but not least on the um, discussion was uh, Canada Day celebrations. Um, as you know, there are a lot of restrictions being put in place for gatherings, um, including things like no more than 50 cars for any specific event, which is a new one as of Friday. So I actually just received uh, a message from our um, <sighs> our event coordinator and we'll be uh, talking tomorrow about potential activities for Canada Day uh, moving forward for 2020. There are no recommendations, so you have the re report in front of you as presented. Any questions? Councillor Elliott. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the report. Um, just a, a question comment about, about the Elliott Street housing. Uh, a concerned individual just contacted me very recently um, about about uh, some contractors in there from Alberta, and he wanted to know why Albertans are coming here and da da da. And he talked to them, and apparently they were from there. I said, "Look, it's a BC housing situation, but does has anybody heard anything?" That's that's it. Yeah. No. So it's a pri. I mean, basically, we treat it as a private uh, project. So. Uh, it's up to them uh, to manage that. Uh, so uh, we are uh, working with BC Housing and the Quinnell Shelter Society to have them come to council as a delegation. So this uh, conversation we had executive, we want in the public domain. We do have our own questions about the operations of the Elliott Street project and about what will happen with the shelter uh, at Seasons House post Elliott Street coming up and running. So uh, we do hope to flush that conversation out. And if council members at that time do want to raise with the proponent BC Housing, how they're managing COVID or how they're managing uh, their contracts with respect to out of town or out of province contractors, that's an appropriate time to ask a question like that. Okay, Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, thank you, Councillor Rudenberg. I had a, um, I guess it's more of a comment um, question regarding number three on your report um, pertaining to the provision of PPE. Um, today was uh, inspection day 
on, on the street, street where I own a business and uh, WorkSafe BC conducted a thorough uh, review of my business as well as many others. And I directly asked the inspector um, if I would like to provide masks to my customers or to my employees, how would, how would I go about buying them or where would I get them? He did not know. And he called me back later, uh, about two hours later uh, from his supervisor and they advised me to go to Costco and buy them there. So I really think that the onus is on us to come up with a made in Quinell solution to this, uh, telling businesses to drive to Costco to buy a box of Max. I think that's, that's ridiculous. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that little anecdote. Yeah, and and I, counsel, yeah. sorry, go ahead, counselor. But I was going to say, I appreciate that because that's one of the, one of the concerns we've heard through the business calls even. And I, and I'm sure that uh, director Reed can, um, can uh, back me up here is is that how how do we get the PPEs to our community how can our community members have what they need to open up safely and be able to maintain their business because you know even when you order stuff online you're restricted to one or two boxes you know which may be 50 in a box if you're a hair salon or a nail place you could go through that in less than, you know, a couple hours in the morning if you and your clients are wearing them. So it is a real concern. Uh, Mayor Simpson? Yeah, I just, I raised uh, this question uh, on the conference call uh, with uh, the Minister of Housing Municipal Affairs, uh, Minister Robinson, uh, because it is a concern for business continuity uh, being able to continue to operate, especially, for example, salons or other areas where it's more than just masks, it's gloves and it's uh, single use uh, uh, smocks, etc. Right. Uh, and it was very interesting because she said staff noted it, but the very next day, the Minister of Labor made an explicit public statement that businesses were on their own finding PPE. Uh, so, you know, the government basically said, uh, hands off, uh, it's up to the individual businesses to find that out. So I think the work that we're doing of trying to understand what the issue is for businesses I just got a report on my desk on the not-for-profit side as well. So I've got a, a, um, a spreadsheet of kind of what they may or may not need. And we'll have a conversation about how and if uh, we can assist in some kind of collaborative effort to address that issue. So, okay. Uh, other questions or comments on the executive committee report? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, so the Caribou Regional District uh, Board Report you have, again, it's just to make sure that you're seeing these, you're updated. The one area that I would point out is an area under the uh, Regional Hospital uh, District. Uh, we had quite a conversation about an ask uh, for the hospital grant funding uh, for the Caribou Foundation Hospital Trust. Uh, there's $100,000 in the, in the previous budgets uh, for trust to apply to, and you'll see uh, that the Caribou Foundation Hospital Trust uh, asked for uh, almost all of that 100000 uh, for some nursery equipment. Uh, you may remember uh, they had some maternity nurse uh, issues, so the trust has targeted their maternity ward to try and upgrade some things. Uh, we will be looking at backstopping uh, the south and the north should any of our foundations come forward with a capital request uh, that makes uh, the, us exceed the 100,000. So if our hospital auxiliary or somebody comes forward and they want to do something at GR Baker, for example, uh, we can cover it uh, this year, but we're going to look at the policy next year and potentially assign 100,000 uh, to each of the three sub-regions so that uh, we don't get into a situation like this. So that's the only uh, piece of note. The rest of it's uh, normal business uh, for CRD. Any questions or comments on the CRD report? Okay, seeing none, let's move into staff reports then. And we'll start with the city manager on the phased reopening of city facilities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, the purpose of this report is to provide council an update on our reopening plans. I would just like to say up front that this is very much a work in process. Uh, the, the information is changing kind of on a daily basis. So this is not the final plan. This is the plan as we know it at this point. 
Um, as well, this report also talks about recommendations from the uh, BC Rec and Parks Association. And th those recommendations have now come through. Uh, we'll talk about those a little later. And uh, Director Norburn, I see is on this call, so he's been following up with that. So I may pass it to him, or if there are any questions about that, we may pass it over to uh, Jeff to answer those questions. Uh, so what the intent is, it is recommended by a, our lawyer firm, is that council actually passes a resolution to support the reopening plans. It, I think it gives a little bit more um, protection to staff that we're not just on our own doing things, but council supports what we're trying to achieve. So a summary of what we're doing so far. Uh, there are numerous city facilities that must be considered when we're developing the reopening plans. Sectoral specific reopening plans are in various stages of development by WorkSafe. The BC uh, Recreation and Parks Association, BCRPA, and various other specific governing organizations in addition to the overriding advice from the Public Health Office. So the Public Health Office obviously set uh, guidelines around physical distancing and how, if you can't achieve distancing, what do you need for protections? The city is attempting to balance public safety concerns with the desires of the public to be able to start to transition to the next phase of COVID-19. I must just add one thing. There's also desires from a segment of the public to keep things locked down because there's still a lot of fear out there. So there's lots of differing desires from the public. It's not just that they want us to open up. Specifically, some of the following preparations are being taken. City Hall and other public facilities are subject to the guidelines of Works ABC. So City Hall will be open, our intent is to be open for June 1st to the public. Uh, we're installing plexiglass dividers and distancing controls and the little markers on the floor is what I mean by distancing controls have been put in place for public access to the front desk at City Hall. The meeting rooms, including council chambers, are being re viewed with regard to compliance with the rules regarding distancing. So setting new low capacities for each room, including this room and council chambers, and, and the foyers will have a low capacity, which is set by our HR folk, sorry, our HR person, and our uh, assistant fire chief, trying to interpret the rules of WorkSafe and, and making sure that those rules are, are interpret it correctly for the type of room and meetings that we're going to be having. So that's ongoing. Um, the meeting rooms are not going to be available uh, for public use at this point in time. We're still using them for staff meetings and we may invite the odd public member in but not in general for public use. And a date is not being set in place for the resumption of in-person council meetings most likely not before the end of June. That's actually an area that's interesting. Some municipalities are, are moving towards resumption of those services as soon as possible, uh, with the feeling being that they're just, we don't get the adequate uh, transparency to the public unless they're in-person meetings. And, and you, you have to agree that is the ideal, right? So we are working towards that. But like I say, likely not before the end of June. Well, one point I missed, in general, staff are welcomed back to work in their offices starting June 1. Uh, that date is flexible and managers are interpreting, interpreting that on a flexible basis for different staff who have different uh, conditions or concerns about uh, being back at work or different vulnerabilities in their own home environment. So we're trying to be very flexible with regards to that. Uh, for recreation and parks, the city is still waiting to receive sectoral guidelines and as i just said we those are just coming out i don't know if we have the final ones or or the or the final draft i'm not sure jeff can talk to that a bit more in a bit um, what we're finding though is that those bcrpa guidelines are very much high level guidelines they're not prescriptive they don't say you can open your playgrounds on such and such a date you can open your gyms on such and such a date or you must do this to open them they're very guidelines saying here's what we're trying to achieve allowing room for individual interpretation so city parks including the riverwalk trails never were closed due to COVID, so they of course remain open they were a signed appropriately. 
We've talked a few times about our low risk outdoor venues are already being open. That includes skateboard park, bike parks, dog park, tennis and pickleball courts. Playground openings are problematic. And there's a couple of issues there. The, the biggest one I think is the ability to maintain a sterile environment. And in fact, I think it's really the almost the impossibility of being able to maintain a sterile environment unless you're willing to go to the extent of, of doing a, a cleanup after every single child has used that playground equipment, which is clearly impossible from a budget, from a manpower, and just from a straight practicality perspective. So playground openings are problematic. Having said that, again, they are outdoor venues, which by their very nature, outdoor venues are have de being determined to be um, lower risk. In addition, the CDC, particularly down in the States, is, seems to be revising their rules around or their thoughts around how long the virus will stick on surfaces and still be uh, effective. So there's some thoughts about maybe it's not quite so bad for sticking on surfaces. And of course, the users of playgrounds Typically, our younger folk who seem to be a bit more resistant to uh, COVID. In addition, uh, one of the other areas of uh, difficulty is water parks. So they kind of, we think they kind of go together, water parks and playgrounds, the same level of risk. But uh, we've received some information or some advice from one organization that they feel that water parks and pools are highly problematic and need to be on a much slower opening schedule. So again, I'm going to pass it over to Jeff in a minute and he can maybe talk to that a little bit as well. So with regards to uh, city rec facilities, we will be bringing recommendations to the next joint planning committee meeting in early June. So we're not going to repeat all those recommendations here. The, uh, I think the appropriate body is to do that through joint planning. Uh, organized sports and their usage of city facilities will be subject to the advice that we will receive from the various sports associations. So I think what's going to happen is if user groups approach us and expect to have uh, or, or request to have usage of our fields and facilities, we will ask them for their plans, written plans for how they're going to be or how they're planning on dealing with COVID. And those plans have to line up with the recommendations from their various sports associations. You can't talk about it in general because every sport has different levels of contact and th therefore different risk factors. Sorry, if I could just clarify on that point because I thought we'd had a conversation that we we're not going to deal with our local groups unless the provincial association has signed something off right that is the intent mr mayor yeah. and and then we would engage with them so if for example you know, softball comes and says we've got a kind of a covid reopening plan but we're aware that softball bc has not issued their COVID reopening guidelines, we're not going to engage in the conversation, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. That is Just so we're clear because council could end up getting approached by individual teams who think they've got a great plan or individual sports who think they've got a great plan. Uh, but the answer that even staff will be given is if we don't have a plan from softball BC or soccer BC or whatever, we're not even having the conversation, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, it's not local plans account, it's the provincial plan and then how are you going to action the provincial plan with the R facilities. We've already had some sort of light conversations or softball conversations about this. That's why I'm emphasizing that point because we do have some people who are antsy to get onto our sports facilities, but in the absence of that provincial structure, we don't want staff running around trying to deal with one-offs uh, and individuals without the provincial structure. Yeah, and what we're expecting is we're expecting that the, the local organization gives us their COVID plan, which is has been sanctioned by their, yeah. their sport body. So it's not a made in Quinell solution, but it is presented to us. We're not going to do the research and say, you must do this and this and this. That's up to them when they come and make that request for the field. 
uh, I think that covered it off for the facility perspective. Um, I'm going to actually pass it over to, uh, before we get into the bylaw services section, because it's kind of a bit of a different theme there, but uh, pass it over to uh, Jeff to see what his thoughts are, if he has any more comments to add to that. Oh, oh. Jeff, over to you, bud. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a new to Zoom, so this is uh, an experiment. Um, yeah, so the BCRPA uh, guidelines did come out. Byron's already kind of uh, mentioned that they're very uh, high level. They're not prescriptive. They basically provide, it's almost like a toolkit, uh, you know, a, a checklist, a series of, you know, tools you can use to make decisions about what is safe and what isn't safe and when you should open and when you shouldn't open. So uh, that is very recent, uh, just officially released today, although we did see a, an advanced copy of it yesterday. Uh, Richard's going through it. Uh, we're going through it. We'll talk about it. And I, I think that we'll be able to bring some recommendations to the uh, Joint Planning Committee on Tuesday with regard to, uh, you know, what, what we think would be an appropriate plan, I guess, for gradually reopening and uh, restarting some services. Um, as Byron mentioned, there is all, all manner of inconsistency with different, uh, you know, organizations that are making recommendations that contradict the recommendations of another organization. Again, we're sorting through that and I, I will use the, the BCRPA toolkit to uh, sort of assess that, uh, you know, those kinds of conflicts and I guess do the best that we can to make recommendations. But, you know, the majority of those facilities are sub-regional rec uh, facilities that uh, would go to the Joint Planning Committee for, uh, for that. And they have a meeting on uh, June the 9th. So we anticipate that that meeting will go forward uh, so that we can bring this uh, uh, report to that committee. Um, and obviously things keep changing on a daily basis, even things that, you know, that are in this report, like uh, playgrounds, uh, has been quite a bit of discussion about them since, you know, this report was written. Um, it does appear that a lot of the health authorities are saying that playgrounds uh, are, uh, are potentially uh, safe to reopen. Uh, we're in discussions with the school district here, and we want to coordinate the opening of school district playgrounds with the opening of uh, city playgrounds, if that's at all possible, just so that we have a consistent message that goes out to the community and, you know, we don't have an issue where city playgrounds are closed, but school playgrounds are open or vice versa. Um, you know, as Byron said, with regard to the field users, I think uh, the Municipal Insurance Association is working with BCRPA. They're developing uh, templates for communities to use that would basically be added to our rental agreement. So when a group uh, rents a facility and they sign a rental agreement, they would also be signing uh, an agreement that would, uh, you know, where they would state that they're, uh, you know, that they're adhering to the uh, orders of the provincial health office and that they're, uh, you know, uh, reducing the risk of COVID by social distancing and so on. Uh, we would have all of that into the into an agreement that uh, that they sign when they sign a rental agreement for uh, renting any of our facilities or parks. So um, I think all of that's in place. Uh, I realize it's happening a little bit slower than uh, maybe everybody would like, but I think it is coming together fairly quickly and hopefully we'll have more of our facilities uh, indoor and outdoor available to the community to use uh, shortly. So before we go on to the bylaw piece, are there any questions about the stepped reopening of City Hall or facilities without getting into joint planning work? Okay, seeing none, let's get into the bylaw piece then. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so bylaw services, the role of the City of Cornell Bylaw Enforcement has been challenging during this pandemic. The city has made these officers available to assist the public health officers with public education and being the first line of response to complaints related to the application of public health orders. And I would dare say that the majority of the complaints that probably have come up have gone first to bylaw, to bylaw folks to go out there and do some enforcement. And the enforcement that they do, we're not issuing tickets, they go and they do public education and talking to people and trying to stop them from standing too close. As the province moves into phase two of the COVID response, 
the province, based on the messaging that they're sending out, and I attached a copy of one of the letters, is expecting the city of Quesnel bylaw enforcement staff to take even a larger role. As per the attached note, it would like our bylaw officers to become knowledgeable about all the sectoral guidelines at WorkSafe BC and to start working with businesses to come into compliance, although still on a complaint basis. And with all due respect, to the fact that the province is in a state of emergency and you know an all hands on deck approach is good it may become untenable at some point in the future and i'm actually modifying the words what are in the report the report says it is becoming untenable i think that's a bit of a a stretch i think our concern is it may become untenable depending what that work level is because it, again it's on a complaint basis if we don't get the complaints it won't become untenable the issue though is the, for our bylaw officers to provide the support that they're looking for, they're really looking for someone who's got some expertise in all the various sectoral reopening plans. And our bylaw officers, it's not their job to A, find what those plans are, study them, go in, check businesses, see if they're in compliance. That's really not part of our plan. So in addition, our bylaw department is entering into a busy season the city specifically added resources to bylaw enforcement to achieve its objectives, not provincial objectives. In addition, not mentioned in this report, is we get no money from the province for bylaw usage, none, zip. Issues that should be addressed if city bylaw officers are going to start supporting WorkSafe BC operations are funding, training, and human resource availability. And I think those are all the obvious ones. Um, I don't have a recommendation around that. I just wanted to bring it to council's attention so that if this becomes more of a problem, we follow up on it, or maybe on a proactive basis, we send a, a note to the province saying, hey, just so you know, we're not doing your work for you. But just that's at council's discretion, but I, I think it's, it could turn into an issue. And I'll leave it at there, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to ask Director Turner to comment, and I have a couple of comments based on the mayor and chair's conversations with the minister uh, over the last couple of weeks. I just have two other points I'd like to bring up that are sort of uh, uh, being um, uh, problematic for us. And I guess um, one of the issues is that uh, over the last little bit, we've seen some uh, notices that healthcare workers, a whole, a whole spectrum of provincial workers and people working in the provincial field um, are going to be getting some additional pay because of, yeah. because of um, uh, being susceptible to uh, um, harm, I guess, um, for lack of a better way of saying that. Um, the, the um, issue I have is that a lot of those individuals and a lot of those professions, especially in our area, are actually in, 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 in cases where they are actually in reduced work areas. Our bylaw officers have increased their scope of work and increased their susceptibility to issues. And of course, they have not been, they were not named as one of the uh, groups that would be given this extra pay. Um, that's, that, was, that, was, that was a bit of a, a pointed stick for me. However, even more annoying was actually just came up tonight is was that like hearing the WCB officers are going around the community doing inspections from everything that we have seen. And you know what, I like that. I actually welcome that. That's great if that's what's happening. Um, I have two, two concerns. One is that um, we have had situations where other provincial health officers have been going around giving misinformation um, that we've had to point out. Um, and even in one of those cases, I was, it was questioned to me whether or not they were, they were a, an official person. Uh, the, the quote was, oh, I hope this isn't another imposter. So I'm wondering a little bit about that. Um, also, but if it is WCB, I would hope that they would give us the, the, um, uh, the benefit of A, coming and letting us know that they're going around doing these checks, and B, talking with our bylaw services. One of the things our bylaw services are told in, in, in the uh, actual correspondence you have there is that they are not to contact WCB unless it's a typical WCB related issue, which would say to me, unless it's an employee issue, not a public issue. Yeah. Um, that's the only way I can interpret that. Um, so I'm left very confused as to who's playing what role right now. Sorry, that's my <laughs> little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, I, so I, 
at the very beginning of this whole process, there was a substantive conversation around bylaw on the mayors and chairs uh, weekly call with Minister Robinson. Uh, and I think it's important uh, for context uh, for council to understand there are many communities who do not have bylaw services uh, and many who might have a single uh, bylaw officer in some kind of part time or casual function. In those cases, uh, those in those individual communities and or regional districts uh, were given the green light to establish some form of bylaw function uh, with direct funding from EMBC. Um, so Emergency Management BC was funding uh, bylaw through that. That meant that uh, those of us who have robust bylaw capacity are in effect uh, being somewhat punished uh, because our taxpayers are already funding the function. Uh, under the public health orders, uh, I think it was about a 16 page document came out saying that bylaw were not to enforce public health orders. We were not supposed to get in that game. Uh, and, and it took them 16 pages to basically say, don't get involved in this. Public health orders need to be dealt with public health officers and all bylaw would do was do a referral and a special number uh, was established for those referrals. If bylaw got the complaint, they did the referral and the public health officer came and actually did the work if necessary. Now we come to WorkSafe BC and quite frankly, I would argue that WorkSafe BC is highly problematic with respect to enforcing their own rules independent of COVID never mind now trying to understand what COVID looks like in each individual retail, each individual salon, each individual bank, each individual physiotherapist place, you name it, they're going to really struggle to understand what their generic COVID guidelines are going to look like in individual business circumstances. And I know from a, uh, experience that they have really struggled, for example, in camps uh, that have been operating uh, to the point that camp contractors have said the biggest, single biggest risk factor of introducing COVID into the camp are the work safe officers who show up and don't know what the hell they're doing uh, because they're the outsiders who are coming into the camp and wandering around telling everybody how to do their job and then taking off again. So I think there's a whole bunch of traps uh, here for us. And I think that we should politely but firmly say to the province that our bylaw officers are busy, thank you very much. They are funded by the municipal ratepayers to do municipal work. And that if the province would like some local support for WorkSafe, they can fund it and we'll figure out how to work with WorkSafe to make it happen. But I don't think we should allow it to become a bylaw function for the reasons already stipulated by staff, but I think it's a huge trap uh, for us. And so that's my two bits worth based on experience and conversations with the ministers. The other piece that, that I think is highly problematic and it comes back to the playground piece. So, we asked, a number of us asked, for some pretty you know, reasonable guidelines for ramping up swimming pools in particular, for example, playgrounds, because I think if we're gonna keep playgrounds closed, we have to hard fence them. This business of you know, just having uh, some do not enter tape around is not working, and many communities are really struggling with that. We would have to go to hard fence. When, when those of us who are asking those questions of, how do we ramp those back up? The response we got from the minister was, well, we never told you to close them. So again, we could end up in a situation where we bleed into some provincial responsibilities. We now, because who knows how long this COVID thing is gonna go on, who knows whether we're gonna do a hard stop and a restart and a hard stop and a restart, we may end up having bylaw taken up fairly substantially 
uh, with a function that's not theirs. And then when we go to talk to them afterwards about, okay, well, hang on a second, we've got two of our three bylaw officers who are now doing effectively inspections for COVID in, in open businesses. And the answer might be, yeah, well, we never said we would fund them. So I think we need to avoid this trap and send a nice letter saying, no, thank you, unless you give us a specific funded position uh, that we're happy to hire on and do this work. So let's deal with this in two pieces uh, uh, with respect to the recommendations. Uh, I would like, uh, given uh, the city manager's response, the explicit uh, or the or request, uh, the explicit uh, recommendation approval, uh, motion approving the planning for the COVID-19 pandemic reopening of city facilities, and then I'll open up the dialogue around uh, the bylaw. So Councillor Rudenberg, you're moving that. Councillor Paul, you're seconding that. Okay, any further questions or comments on the reopening strategy as presented? Okay, so anyone opposed to that? So that motion has passed unanimously. And then the floor is open around the bylaw piece. Councillor Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I agree 100%. Yeah, I don't, I, we're busy. Our people down there are busy doing what they should be doing. And, and I don't think that we should be taking on the responsibility of the government or WCB and going into inspect uh, facilities that should be paid for, or mandated some other way, um, and it, it traps, right? That's just it. We, have, we, we never told you to, to do that in the first place, so no, hard, hard no. Councillor Paul? Uh, thank you, yes, I agree with uh, everything that you said there, Mr. Mayor, and um, if we let them get away with it this time, uh, this could be opening the floodgates for something different other than COVID. COVID. Okay. So, Councillor Rittenberg. Thank you. Um, so, I would say the same. And, you know, I had meetings last week and the whole idea of this being downloaded onto bylaw officers was never part of a discussion that we had. It was, you know, the public health officers, WorkSafe BC, bylaw officers were kind of that third piece of the discussion. So, you know, reading the letter from the deputy minister there, it's very clear, you know, what their expectations are. And I totally agree. If this is going to be, and I mean, when I look at the needing to understand, sorry, where is it here? Um, knowledgeable of all the sectoral guidelines of WorkSafe BC. I'm sure you've probably briefly seen them uh, because we, we've got them available for businesses, you know, and I can't imagine our bylaw officers having time to actually sit down for each sector and being able to figure out because there are nuances for every sector out there. And if you read this section, then you have to go over here and read another whole bit over here. They're not very well laid out right now. Even if you wanted to sit down and try and figure it out, I think as business owners, Councillor Vic would probably agree with me, they're not well laid out. And so for, for you know, our bylaw officers to sit down and try to understand them for absolutely every sector that we have in our business community, yeah. No, um, I'm not sure what the total answer is, but I think asking for funding for a position, if this is going to be um, what they are going to ask of us, then that's where we need to go. So if I, if I could make a, I see Councillor Vic, if I could make a recommendation then on, on a potential motion, it would be two part. One, our uh, desire, uh, strong desire is that the province establish the same process that they established with public health uh, officers, uh, that uh, all we do is act as a conduit uh, for WorkSafe BC complaints uh, and fire those off to WorkSafe BC for their compliance officers to investigate. So that's our preferred route, is they mirror what they did with public health orders and public health officers. And in the absence of that, if they want bylaw to be directly involved with enforcement, uh, that they fund a position or positions 
uh, for the work related uh, to that. And just, uh, you know, two-step it, here's our preferred way. And if you're not gonna do it that way, uh, then we would only do it with funding. So go ahead, I would just add, I would just, sorry, I mean, yeah, I would just add enforcement or education because the trap here is that they may, they may say, well, we're not asking you to enforce, we're yeah. asking you to educate. Educating is still a problem because we might not have the- Yeah, absolutely. Enforce and, and educate. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Councillor Rudenberg, I saw your hand go up there. You good with that? And Councillor Elliott. Okay, Councillor Vic, I, I saw your hand go up before. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add other than um, whatever, however we're gonna communicate this, like we're in this right now, it's happening today. Um, I don't know if a letter is fast enough. I'm not sure, this is urgent. Like they're roaming about today. So um, the burden that we're placing yeah. on our bylaw is today. So uh, yeah. there, there has to be a high level of, of, of certainty and um, action on this. Yeah, so Director Turner will follow up with WorkSafe BC uh, just to find out what's going on with their uh, compliance and enforcement or education scheme. I can certainly reach out to, to the appropriate minister's office, uh, but in order to formalize the dialogue with the province, a letter is an appropriate way. And I think city manager, we can uh, get something out uh, yeah. pretty quick yeah. uh, on this. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this? So on the motion then, uh, all in favor or any opposed rather. Okay. Seeing none, that motion passed unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next. Uh, transit. Now, Director Norbin, I, I believe we've seen the bulk of this already, or is it one of those reports I read in advance of it coming on the agenda? I'm, I'm having a deja vu moment because I thought we already... Oh, no, I think we need to go through this point by point. What's that? Sorry. Uh, yeah. There was yeah. a report. Uh, this one, of course, has been updated with new information that has come to light since then, and that okay. uh, original report might have gone to an in-camera meeting part of it. Okay, so let's uh, then stick to the highlights uh, for Council then. Okay, well, the purpose of this report is to advise uh, Council of the effects that COVID-19 is having on transit revenue. Um, and options for consideration to offset yeah, the revenue shortfall. In camera. Uh, so uh, where we, we last left off for the things that have happened very recently, uh, we've uh, had an announcement from BC Transit that, that starting June 1st, uh, we will once again be collecting um, transit fares. So that was something that had been suspended in uh, March uh, when COVID first became a, an issue. Um, uh, so uh, we were asked to uh, work with the transit operator to provide some statistics on how much use there has been of transit and, uh, and, uh, and how that sort of related to two options that were uh, being discussed, I guess, as potential temporary service reductions if council deemed them uh, necessary to offset some of the lost revenue. Uh, so uh, based on the information that the operator collected, uh, the you know, so the lowest use time for transit is between 7 and 10 p.m. Uh, that is, of course, is, you know, new service that we added uh, a couple of years ago. Um, eliminating transit service weekdays after 6 p.m., which is one of the options, would impact about 16 riders per day. Uh, and eliminating transit service weekday mornings between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. Uh, was another option that was looked at uh, in combination, I guess, with the, with the first option and that would impact another 32 users a day. Uh, so there's three options that are presented for council's consideration. One is to implement option one, which would save about $5,300 a month. Option two would save about $1,800 a month. And uh, what's sort of put forward as option three would, is to make no temporary service reductions at this time and to continue to monitor ridership revenues and expenditures over the coming months uh, as the province gradually reopens and see how that's impacting our budget. And uh, the recommendation is to uh, direct staff to continue to monitor tran transit ridership revenues and expenditures during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic or essentially option three. Okay. Uh, Councillor Elliott, you're moving the recommendation? Okay, seconder for the recommendation, Councillor Rudenberg. Okay, floor is open. Questions or comments? Councillor Elliott. 
Yeah, just briefly, just just the obvious. I don't think we should be making any changes right now. Uh, I don't want to affect anybody's job whatsoever. So thank you for the recommendation. Councilor Paul. Uh, yes, to Jeff. Uh, how close is option three? Like, in other words, where we are at now. Uh, obviously, it's the closest to option two. But is it some distance from option two? Well, option three is to make no service reductions and to just continue to monitor it. And, you know, if there's, you know, increasing concern, we, we don't really know what the impact of COVID will be, how quickly things will reopen and how quickly uh, revenue levels will go back to normal. Uh, we do know that we are getting some savings in handy dart use. Uh, the operator uh, has been really effective in working uh, with us in, in reducing, um, you know, the but basically one bus uh, from two buses down to two buses or down to one bus per day doing handy dart service. So that's resulting in some savings. Uh, we also had the uh, taxi supplement program, which we had hoped that we would start April 1st, but be once the, the COVID uh, pandemic situation sort of ramped up in, in mid March, uh, BC Transit put a hold on all service expansion. So there's some savings uh, connected with that. So basically, in option three, we're saying leave service levels the way they are. Uh, we'll continue to monitor. We'll see how revenue uh, picks up. If it does pick up, at least starting June 1st, we'll be collecting revenue again for transit, which we haven't been uh, since the middle of March. So, um, I mean, that's the difference in, in yeah. terms of... So, so, Director Norbin, all of that's in the report, which everybody should have read. I think the key point, Councillor Paul, is that we're at May 26, and we're going back on June 1st uh, to uh, charging fees again. So it's a bit of a moot point uh, at, at this juncture uh, because we're going back to the approved service levels at the approved fees, uh, supposedly starting June 1st. Go ahead, Councillor Paul. No. You just cut yourself off. <coughs> yeah, you just shut your video off, Councillor Paul. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Runge while you sort out which button you're pushing. Thank you. Uh, uh, so I, I actually will go for option number three. I do like the idea of having uh, that we continue to monitor service because for me the question is in the future if one route truly doesn't have any ridership uh, I'm looking at route three the North yeah. Fraser route right now then then maybe we could sometime in the future look at modifying just that route I'm not sure how that would work but so for now I'm for option three uh, with the continued monitoring thank you so I just want to be crystal clear with council we always monitor ridership is always looked at uh, we always take a reappraisal, uh, sort of an internal dialogue, but as the report indicates, if we want to make any route changes, that is an onerous process that our partner, BC Transit, must first sanction a willingness to do so and then engage us uh, in the process of doing so. And then any scheduled changes that you make is another onerous process of changing the bus route schedule, of publishing the schedule of uh, the whole piece. So when we first had this conversation, it was early on in the process with an unknown time frame for not charging transit fees. We're now a few days from going back to what would be considered the approved service levels. So that's why option three is we can go back to what we always do with transit. We monitor it, we watch it, and we have an approved uh, process, right? So just so that everybody's clear, that's what you're doing. So Mr. Mayor, just to be clear, when we asked for data previously, we did not get weekly data. That is what I actually enjoy, or monthly doesn't matter. We, we did not have access to data on ridership on different routes. So for me, this has been very, very positive for all of us right. to actually see it, well, how it use, was used. Yeah, so Councillor Runge, you haven't been involved in a transit review. So prior to a transit review, data is collected. 
data is not collected on an ongoing basis, nor are we going to collect data on an ongoing basis, right? So we did an interim measure because it was asked for, that's the data you're getting in front of you because we asked for that data to be collected to make a de decision on an indeterminate time frame for a no fee transit. That's the point I'm trying to make. That indeterminate time frame is now gone. Okay. okay. Council Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, a little message came up and it and it hid my mute button. That was my problem, but I sorted it out. Um, my question was that, or I guess my suggestion is that I, I'm willing to go with option three as long as we put a time on it. Like I'd say 90 days and that would take us right through to Labor Day and then, and then they, we would have a look at it. We would have a better picture of what uh, the school picture looks like. Uh, so if this, if this resolution includes uh, some reference to a revisit, uh, then I would be in favor. Okay, so again, I wanna make it, try and make it plainer to council. What you're talking about, if we go back to fee transit, then we also go back to the normal process for doing a transit review, okay? So we would have to pass a resolution of council to do a review of transit. So right now, this is effectively somewhat moot in the sense that the approved transit process kicks in now June 1st. And if council at some point wants to do a review of transit, then we would kick into our formal process. Because the minute we're back to fee for service transit, we're back to the normal process that we use for looking at transit. So just so everybody's clear about that. If sometime in September, we're still feeling that ridership is low and so on, then the direction Director Norburn will be given is to engage formally with transit in a review post COVID. Different scenario than this ad hoc, quick, you know, what are we doing as a result of it being free and as a result of COVID? That's all I'm saying. So right now, just simply say, yeah, fees go back on June 1st, we'll continue to monitor. But in the fall, as part of our 2021 planning, we, if we want to initiate a transit review, we will have to use the formal process to do that. Okay, Councillor Vic. Yeah, I, uh, I just, I just want to sort of articulate that some of our struggle here um, in understanding how this works is it's surprising to me, maybe to other councillors, that it's so challenging for us to pivot on the schedule of transit, and it sounds like that it's not our responsibility. Um, in creating the schedules and systems. It sounds like it's BC Transit who is involved in that process. So in the post-COVID review, uh, in our meetings with BC Transit, we have to articulate that we, our ability to adjust quickly was not there and service could not more or less be adjusted because of the onerous nature of adjusting the schedule. So whatever software is used or however it's done, there has to be a change where municipalities can make much quicker decisions on adjusting routes without blowing up a schedule and causing staff untold hours of work. So, so that would be my only feedback. So Councillor Vic, if you think that we've got an issue here, just trying to imagine what transit looks like <laughs> in Vancouver or Surrey or Port Coquitlam or somewhere else, right? So uh, Director Norbert, uh, just so that we're crystal clear, if we want to do a review of our transit route, when was the last time we did a review and what's the process, the sort of the duration of a normal process to review routes with a view to changing them? Oh, uh, well, I'm trying to remember what year we last did it, but it, it was fairly recently, I would say within the last three years. And the Absolutely. process all in is probably, you know, almost a year, or at least six months. You know, it involves their planning department. So you have to request a service review and then get put into the queue because they only have so many planners and there's communities that want a review done. Um, and then, yeah, the planners come, there's usually public consultation that's involved in surveys and, uh, you know, they have to do an analysis of the routes and the, the, the ridership levels at, you know, different times or whatever. They actually have their planners come up and ride the buses 
usually for a day or two to sort of see what the use is like. And I mean, it's a it's a, an involved process. And then they produce a you know 100 page report with recommendations at the end of it. So it's it's not something that is you know quickly and easily done. It's something that we have to request, get put into the queue for, and uh, you know, and then go through that process to get a report at the end of it. And the likelihood of us getting in the queue with any kind of priority folks is minuscule, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to add one little comment. I touched on it last time we talked about this, kind of around social contract operator service like transit. I, I, going back to a comment made by you, Councillor Vic, about we need the ability to kind of be more agile and make changes quicker. I, I would argue against that. I would argue that we need to try to keep the system as steady state as we can to allow people who rely on it to get back and forth to work, that they have something to count on. If we're changing it because, oh, we, there's a financial crunch here and it prevents people from getting to work either in the morning or in the evening or on the weekends, I think we're really taking a big step backwards. And for the amount of the cost difference, I, I think it's, if you operate a system like this, you have some, we should have some feelings that you need to provide a reliable service. So I'm, I'm going to suggest, uh, because we do, we've got an end camera after this and so on, the decision in front of council is, a, is to go maintain status quo, continue to monitor, which again, at the sake of sounding like a broken record, which is what we do, uh, it's a constant thing. Um, I also want to remind council that we entered into an agreement uh, with the student unions at UNBC CNC, uh, where they are charging themselves a fee for service on a three year contract based on a root configuration uh, that we had integrated into our last uh, review. And the likelihood of us getting an expedited review and getting all the planners from transit to get engaged with us is minuscule. But I would suggest that what we may want to do, and Director Norburn, you may want to tag it, is sometime in the fall, I think council needs to be walked through the transit function more clearly, uh, the partner, and what happened in the last review, because we're going around in circles in this conversation because of that lack of experience and knowledge of transit is the authority, not us. We fund a function, they run the function, okay? Uh, and they're the determinants uh, of that function. What we say is we think that we're, we're paying, you know, too much for empty buses or whatever the case may be. But to the city manager's point, uh, if you're getting one person up to Walmart or one person to QJS or whatever the case may be, uh, then that's factored into the, uh, to the consideration by the planners. But transit is one of those functions uh, that is um, organized for peak hours, not for the regular hours. You run the transit system for when your buses are full. And even if you go down to Vancouver, there are times that buses are running almost empty, but there are times in which, and we've had this over in Anderson Drive, where buses are going past people standing at bus stops because the bus is full. So your system is actually organized for peak time, not low time. So we can do a transit update and review for people how it's done. This recommendation and staff's recommendation, uh, we're going back to fee for service transit. Let's just continue to monitor transit and see where we're at, okay? Councilor Paul, if it's additive. Yes, I hope it's additive and that is a question to staff that, uh, that will staff be continuing to monitor the daily ridership breakdown by time of day, such as is in the report on page 80. So staff do not do that, Councilor Paul. Just so we're crystal clear, we have asked for a special circumstance with the transit operator to get their staff to do headcount. That was a special circumstance outside of the planning function. Okay, so the answer is no. So there's no way of accessing ongoing um, data. We don't do that in a regular year, Councillor Paul. Councillor Runch. Thank you, I'd like to move option number three. It's already moved, it's on the floor. Okay, so all in favor? Any opposed? 
Thank you. We'll get you a review of transit uh, and how it works and how we monitor, et cetera, uh, in the fall. Okay, next, solid waste bylaw and associated municipal ticketing information. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, purposes of this report is to consider amendments to discontinue commercial garbage pickup and restrict setting out garbage carts between 4 a.m. and 8 8 a.m. on the day of garbage collection. It also uh, has an amendment to the MTI bylaw that allows a fine for that of $50. Um, the, the report uh, notes that uh, it is acknowledged that direct enforcement will be difficult. However, we do think that having this fine, it will be help us do targeted enforcement where it's uh, required. Uh, the Policy and Bylaw Committee, as uh, Councillor Elliott noted, has reviewed and has forwarded these recommendations to Council on April 7th, 2020. Um, so I'm going to go right to the recommendation that Council approves mending the solid waste collection and disposal bylaw to one, discontinue commercial garbage pickup and two, restrict placing garbage carts out overnight to the uh, uh, stated times and that Council approves amending mu the municipal ticket information bylaw to include a fine of $50 for not placing garbage carts out according to the bylaw. And I wonder if you could just clarify Councillor Paul's previous question about is this only a bare thing and should we yeah. consider seasonal timeframes? And it is not just a bear thing, actually. It is a wildlife thing. And actually, the notes that I got from bylaw enforcement, because um, even though there might not be as many files, we do get to, to other complaints. Actually, birds are yeah. our most That's problematic issue. So. Yeah. So, and again, as with all of our bylaws, it would be complaint driven. And I can think of a couple of places in South Hills uh, where particularly the ravens, uh, get at uh, the garbage uh, and it's all season uh, or uh, loose dogs uh, knock garbage cans over uh, and go at it. Um, so uh, it's across the board on wildlife and domestic wildlife. I have, uh, I believe, Councillor Elliott and then Councillor Runge. <clears throat> yeah, just uh, moving the recommendation and I, th I think the $50 uh, ticket fee should be in there but like we do with everything else it's more just a communication to people and, and that's a, 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 a just another tool yeah it's adding a consequence uh, do I have a seconder for the motion on the recommendation I'm not seeing a hand waving seconder Councillor Paul okay Councillor Runch you were on the list well, actually, I was hoping it was going to be before the recommendation. I was hoping to split these two motions up because I actually see them fairly mutually exclusive. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm okay with one, but I'm not okay with part two. So I guess, we'll, you know, I guess I'll speak to that since I'm, I have the floor. I, I actually believe that we should educate first. I believe uh, it, it sounds a little, to me, it feels fairly heavy handed. I, uh, I don't think we are actually slowing down um, wildlife by moving a garbage 20 feet to the curb. I, there's issues with regards to shift workers, uh, you know, being up, you know, that four and eight, I don't think that's actually the window where these things are happening. Uh, they're happening, you know, at different times of the day. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say they're not happening, but that's so. So that's Councillor, a, Councillor Runge, as a matter of principle, and I would suggest you go into our MTI bylaw and look at all the things that you would consider heavy handed. Uh, the matter of principle, it's always education first. So everything we do is education first. The problem we have is we have some repeat offenders that have problematic situations and we have no consequence. So this is a long-standing issue where we're adding the normal consequence that's in our MTI bylaw, okay? So regardless of what you look at, uh, it always feels like it's heavy handed when you're adding it. It just adds a consequence to bylaw to deal predominantly with repeat offenders or egregious situations where they have a fallback. Okay. But as to your comment that education first, it should be education first. It always is education first. In fact, it drives me crazy because sometimes the front end education piece delays us from actually getting to a problematic situation a lot faster uh, and in some cases I think we should get to uh, the consequence a lot faster so okay go ahead Councillor Runch. 
Yeah, I, it, so so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the other portion, uh, but with regards to a four o'clock to eight o'clock, whether it's birds or bears, this is not the time actually. The bear is possibly on the, on the side of the road, but on the side of the road, but the bears would actually be at your house also at that time. I, I find, I, I believe this is already covered in other bylaws uh, with regards to unsightly properties. Uh, and the question is, can we put it in there? This way, it just doesn't feel, uh, you know, I just, Okay, so stated, Councillor Vic. Yeah, I was just going to uh, echo uh, the last part of what Councillor Runge was saying. Is there no other uh, tools that we have in the toolbox? Uh, uh, Councillor Runge mentioned unsightly. If if your garbage can is offended, um, you know that that's that's a mess, and you're required to pick it up. It, that would not be an, would that not be an infraction on an existing bylaw that's already on the books? I, I would say I would say not. I mean, I think that would be unrealistic for us to every time someone has their garbage can spilled over that we would go and give them an unsightly uh, or uh, deal with them on a nuisance property aspect. That's that's I think that's a whole other measure. Um, I think that's not even getting to that's not even getting to the purpose of this. I would say. Yeah. Okay. And that would deal with the symptom, not the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a recommendation from PABCOM. Uh, Councillor Paul. Yes, thank you. Was there any discussion about perhaps moving to seven o'clock? And I'm thinking about particularly uh, mill workers that are working the day shift. Uh, they start their day at eight. And I'm wondering if, if, if a compromise might be moving to seven o'clock. That, that, that would shorten, the, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. That would shorten the time frame, Councillor Paul. They're allowed to put it out from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's that we really consider those times and we think that accounts for most shift workers actually that's why those hours are the way they are. So the intention of the change is to prevent people from putting the garbage out the night before. Okay, so, I, I apologize. I, I thought it was the other way around. I'm in no, favor. No, so a shift worker going to work early, going up to Dunkley early or whatever, they've got plenty of time to put it out. It is the shift change is taken into consideration when garbage can be put out. Okay. Councillor Runge. Sorry. So my question, I guess, is to uh, Director Turner then. Uh, we have currently no bylaw on at this time during the day. So if someone were to put it out at a slightly different time, this, this does what? Or does this just ask for people to call in complaints? Correct. Correct, and uh, call in complaints. We would talk to that individual, especially if they are a repeat offender. If it happened one time, again, we're not out there to, to penalize people for that. We're there if someone's repeatedly doing it and causing a problem, we'll probably ask them to take pictures, give us a little bit of proof, and then uh, it, we'll do a, 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 a infraction ticket based on that evidence. Yeah, so Councillor Runge, unless we stipulate otherwise as a council, bylaw enforcement is complaint driven. So as the report indicates, there's no intention for additional enforcement or for bylaw to be driving around looking for garbage cans going out at night. All this is doing is giving us the consequence portion of us dealing with consistent problematic behavior that's resulting in situations in our neighborhoods. So it's a response to things that we've seen, things that bylaw have seen, where they don't have a consequence. So they can go to a person and say to them over and over and over again, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't have this situation, etc." or a bare report that somebody who's been putting their garbage out on a consistent basis at night or whatever the case may be, all it is, and it's the whole point behind the municipal ticketing bylaw is to give a consequence so that when after you've educated and the person continues to exhibit the behavior, there is a nominal fine for choosing to continue to exhibit the behavior. That's how all our bylaws work, whether it's smoking, whether it's whatever the case may be. I agreed. Uh, but when I asked, and I did, I did email uh, Director Turner with regards to the number of bear complaints, I didn't ask with regards to personal complaints. We had, I think, eight complaints over the last three years for bear, for bear things. 
it just feels like we're no. so like, like this no. is better or no. just no sorry that that uh, incorrect go ahead director so, Turner. i would actually say there there was less than that uh, some of those files uh in 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 the wild safe or the wildlife uh file would, would be more than just bears and um the uh the complaints um that are are in there are are, are, are just ones that we received. What I did know to you is we've been, we've been told a number of times that, you know, these issues are largely go unre unreported. Um, and uh, WildSafe uh, BC has asked us um, to, to do this. This is a best practice that they're promoting all over the province um, to help discourage. And again, it's wildlife issues with, with garbage being placed out overnight. Yeah, just a point. Um, we actually, Matt and I had the conservation officer come and visit us. And I think I spoke to the set after quite a while ago when we talked about the wild Safe program and he commented on how many times he has to deal with bears. And one of his requests was that we do something like this to deal with our garbage. So they, they are dealing with quite a few bear complaints that I assume our bylaw officers aren't getting. So he wouldn't get, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he would never tell our bylaw officer he would do. No, deal he with deals with it himself. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. Have so, <clears throat> Councillor Elliott, and then I, I'm going to move us on and, and suggest uh, with Councillor Elliott uh, and Councillor Paul's permission, we'll split uh, the resolution as suggested uh, because uh, they're two separate items. Uh, so if Councillor Elliott and Councillor Paul, you're comfortable uh, with that as mover and seconder of two separate motions, then we'll deal with them separately. Councillor uh, Elliott, did you still want to comment? Yeah, I, I think just to, just to wrap it up, this is been done in many communities that that I've lived in before uh, you're gonna hear people screaming if a bear gets shot if a neighbor isn't you know cleaning up after themselves and there's no uh, there's no penalty to that he's never gonna change so this is happening all over the province it's just us uh, following suit and also on changing the times for the time of year and stuff you just want to be consistent so That's we're not gonna good. go out and try and penalize people it's just a to have a consequence at the very end if no one's listening. Yeah. Okay, so in order to move us along, I'm going to suggest that we now uh, take the vote on the first motion, which is with respect to the changes needed for uh, the discontinuation of the commercial garbage pickup and the restriction on placing garbage cans uh, out overnight, sorry. So we're just going to do so that it'll have to be split at just a commercial garbage pickup. It's all one bylaw, just a note though, right? When it gets to the bylaw section. Yeah. yeah, but we'll deal with it here, I guess, and then we'll just have to vote the bylaw as the bylaw, right? Yeah. Okay, so that way people can register vote here and then deal with the bylaw and the bylaw. So, uh, so this is just the approval. Again, it's just this business of we get a report about a bylaw that's then later uh, on the agenda as a bylaw. So that people can register their votes with respect to the two discrete items. So on the discontinuing of commercial garbage pickup, changes to bylaw, all those, uh, anyone opposed? Okay, and then the second would be with respect to the uh, restriction on placing garbage cans out overnight, which is the time and the uh, bylaw fine of $50 uh, at the end of whatever education period or the normal process that bylaw uh, would use. Uh, so uh, anyone opposed? Councillor Runge opposed. Councillor Vick, okay. So with that, uh, we'll move on uh, then, and you'll just have to decide. Councillor Runge and Vick, well, you'll have to decide because we've got a single bylaw amendment. So you just have to decide how you're going to vote uh, now that you've registered your vote with respect to the report. Sorry, was that two separate? No, so so. I, so I've embedded, yeah, the, the restricting hours and the fine mm -hmm. to do with the putting the garbage cans out will be the second motion. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, then uh, we'll move on to regional community airports. And for the sake of time, um, this is uh, what we saw at joint planning. Uh, and joint planning basically said, send it back to city council and the CRD for separate letters of support. So if I could have a motion uh, just for uh, sending a letter of support, Councillor Paul, Councillor Elliott, second. Any further questions or comments? Okay, anyone opposed? Okay, that's carried. 
Okay, and then moving on then, uh, if uh, Lindsay can flash up video. No, we don't need another report. We dealt with it at joint planning. No, I thought on the uh, museum. Next. That's after Lindsay's report. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Lindsay, on your report on the Catalyst uh, grant application and council. You should have received that as a separate item. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek council's approval for two applications to the Catalyst program funding through the Caribou Chilcotin Coast Tourism Association. Uh, the first grant, it's for the RV park planning. The money from this grant, it'll provide um, an updated business case, design development, and environmental services, and a more detailed cost estimate. Um, this will bring the project um, ready closer to um, applying for more funding for implementation. Uh, the second grant application is for the cultural center um, for a phased planning. And the money from this grant will provide an updated design and business plan for a phase approach to construction of the Lataco Dene Cultural Center. Um, and I just want to note, we're still waiting um, for quotes from some architects and from some design firms. So the finances are still a little bit hazy right now, but we do, um, we do kind of know how much we're going to ask for, um, for both grants combined. Um, so is there any questions before I move on to recommendations? Yeah, and just uh, if I could for Lindsay, uh, so this is one of these hurry up things. So staff are kind of scrambling to figure out uh, and a resolution from council is required. So to Lindsay's point, there's still some due diligence to do. We're dealing with some ballpark pieces and may have to come back uh, for a fine tune, but we need to get the resolutions in order to get uh, the grant application in. And just for clarification on the Lataco Denny Cultural Center, I've had a conversation with Chief uh, LeBrun and he's comfortable with us looking at that center because we went, uh, Lataco went all in, uh, 16 million, probably 18, 19 million now. Uh, and the only question we would be asking here is could we do that as a phased project, two phase or three phase project so that we can actually chunk it and make it more palatable uh, for some of the grant applications coming up. And in particular, any kind of post COVID uh, um, infrastructure grants that may come up and or uh, the reconciliation grants that we've been hearing about uh, for a while. So uh, that's why this is, a, we hope to do this in a timely manner so that we understand what the possibilities are for advancing that project in a phased uh, situation. So, okay. Uh, Councillor Elliott. Yeah, I do apologize as this came out uh, a little bit late. I've been at work all day. I think I'm getting the gist of it. Are there any matching funds that are needed? Yeah, so in, uh, in the report, uh, Councillor Elliott, uh, that you wouldn't have in front of you then, uh, for recommendation one, uh, there would be a 12,000, uh, that's the RV uh, piece. Uh, uh, so that's uh, where Utilities Yard currently is, looking at an RV and campground. Uh, the total ask for that grant is 30000 and the council would use 12000 from its operating uh, budget towards that. So you would be asking for eighteen dollars uh, from the Catalyst uh, uh, fund. And no, then, no, sorry, 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 30 So the total ask for that grant is going to be, um, the total project budget for that grant is 42650 Right, my mistake. Yeah, we're going to be asking um, to use $12,000 from the 2020 operating budget. Yeah. yeah, and we've already begun some um, dialogue uh, around that uh, project. Thanks for that clarification. So I'm going to turn it over to you to then clarify the financing, Lindsay, for the second one then so I don't screw it up. Um, yeah, so for the second one, that's where the we're still waiting for some quotes. Um, but we're asking for the use of up to $10,000 from Council Initiatives Fund. And we're thinking that um, we'll apply for $20,000 for the Catalyst Fund. So we think the project will be somewhere around $30,000 um, to finish that phase design. But that's just ballpark right now. We should get um, updated quotes in the next couple of days. The grant <laughs> is on Friday. So 
hopefully, hopefully we get them soon, but we're asking for um, up to $10,000 for council initiatives, but that doesn't mean that we'll have to use the whole 10,000. And, and again, Lindsay, just for clarification for council, based on your assessment of the application process, if we've got some leverage dollars that we're leveraging up, it will just make it you know, a more appealing grant application. Is that correct? Yep. Yep, okay. that's correct. And uh, Director um, Bolton, we haven't tapped into council initiatives uh, this, this year. year. We're still eating away at what we had in the... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Councillor Elliott, saw your hand again. Yeah, thank you very much for the, the uh, clarity on that. It's appreciated. Both of these uh, projects are massive for us moving forward. I'd move both recommendations if that's what yeah, you're so looking let's, for. Let's deal with one recommendation at a time so you can, uh, we'll let you move the first one with respect uh, to the RV and camp uh, ground. Can I have a seconder for that? Councillor Vic, questions or comments on that particular project? Councillor Paul. Yes, thank you. A um, couple of questions. Uh, in this process, uh, will will we be making um, any contact with the existing RV park operators? Uh, and I'm thinking, particularly, we have two in town, but we have three within the within the region or within the the Greater Quinell area. I'm just wondering if they're going to be made aware of what what our plans are. I'll have the city manager speak to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the intent behind this RV park, as as we've been our initial discussions is a bit of a different design where we're considering this for short stay only RV park. So for three days or less. So we, it's not the direct competition between places where you pull in for the week and you're down by the lake and you're enjoying that. It's more if you have, a, if there's a tournament in town or you're driving through the town. So at this point in time, we have done no extra level of consultation with RV parks in the region. And again, just for clarity, this is a planning document. So uh, we don't even know what we know yet about what's possible on that site. Uh, so it's to plan the site. Uh, we will have questions post that yeah. on the management of the yeah. site and the operations, et cetera, right? And if I could add one more word, this is also part of the waterfront plan right. that was adopted the by council approved. as their vision for that area, right? Yeah. So this is not a new idea we're springing on to. The yeah. Board. Okay. Councillor Paul, another one? Well, they're just a continuation of the same one. And that is that, that I will be uh, voting against it because um, as I voted in the budget, I'm not voting for anything that's, um, that's non-essential or discretionary at this time. Any other questions or comments pertinent to the item in front of us? Can I make okay. a comment on that? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, $20,000 was put aside in the 2020 operational budget for this specific project already. So it's not like we're eating into other funds. This um, money was already set aside for this project. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Lindsay. I'm sure that Councillor Paul uh, may or may not be aware of that fact. Um, so, uh, but I appreciate noting it anyway. Uh, so uh, uh, we've got the motion on the floor. Uh, those opposed? Okay, and you want it noted, Councillor Paul? Yes, please, thank you. So in, the, in the future, as I indicated before, don't have me ask, unmute when you know the vote's coming so that you can say, I want it noted, and then I don't have to ask you, okay? So on the next one, on recommendation uh, number two, uh, can I have a mover and seconder? That's the uh, work on the Latakwadeni Cultural Center, uh, Councillor Rudenberg, Councillor Vic, uh, further questions or comments? Councillor Paul? Uh, yes, thank you. I'd just like to have some clarification uh, on whose project, because the project um, was a Lataco Dene project. And um, is Lataco Dene sharing in any of this cost that we're faced with at this particular time? So the the culture center project that was put forward for funding that was denied was a Lataco Denny cultural center project, but we as a city were engaged with them on the planning. And I believe we actually covered almost all of the planning dollars to assist them uh, to get the planning done. So this is on par with what we've done uh, before. 
Uh, it would actually depend on what the grant opening is uh, for uh, if a grant came open, whether partnership uh, works better or individual Aboriginal off reserve works better or whatever. We just need to get the design work done. And the intention for council here would be to contribute 10,000 towards uh, getting some money uh, from this uh, new round of application. And so uh, it's a decision to expedite uh, this. Uh, Latakwadeni does not currently have a band manager and they have some staff issues. So we're just trying to move this along so that we're prepared in the event that infrastructure grants open. So uh, there's been no dialogue with Latako about them funding it at this time. Okay. Okay, on, on the motion then, uh, all, uh, anyone opposed? Yes, I'm opposed uh, and um, I want my vote recorded, please. Okay. Uh, next, thank you, uh, Lindsay, for that. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. And Lindsay, if you could, through the city manager, once we get the quotes tightened up uh, and we know what we're doing for the Lataco Denny one, just let the city manager know and he can let uh, the uh, council know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. Uh, and then the Museum Visitor Center renovation. All righty. Sorry. The, uh, um, sorry, the purpose of this report is to seek direction from Council with regard to the implementation of the Museum and Visitor Center renovation project, uh, specifically with regard to the closure of the museum to the public, an application no. funding to the Cultural Spaces Fund, <laughs> and for the relocation of the. Uh oh, what's happening? You're not moving, so, like a magic you, trick. You can, you can come in here for water, but you can't come in here to deliver your report. <laughs> well, I was being sensitive to the needs of the other people and concerns that I might be a carrier of the COVID. Um, all right, uh, by please this, you might be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, the renovation of the Museum Visitor Center is a $1.4 million project that has been included in the 2020 capital budget with funding from Northern Development Initiative Trust, Gas Tax, and the Capital Reinvestment Plan. Uh, the Canadian Cultural Spaces Wonder Fund is is accepting applications for the city, and the city may want to apply for funding for the Museum and Visitor Center renovation project for eligible expenses up to 50% of the total project cost, estimated to be approximately $450,000 to $500,000. Uh, the museum has been closed since mid-March due to COVID-19, and while it's expected that many museums in the province, I think the BC Museum actually announced that they are opening soon, uh, will be opening in the spring and summer, there may be advantages to not opening the Quinnell Museum this season in light of the planned renovation project this year. Uh, during construction, it will be necessary to relocate the visitor center if it is to continue to provide services to visitors and locals, uh, and the Billy Barker Day offices in Laborde Park would be an ideal location for this. Uh, the Billy Barker Day Society has requested $200 a month in rent to have the visitor center temporarily located in their offices. Uh, so the recommendation in three parts is that council direct staff to apply to the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund for eligible costs up to 50% of the total cost for the museum and visitor center renovation project and that council direct staff not to open the museum in 2020 in order to facilitate the museum and visitor center renovation project and that council direct staff negotiate and enter into a month to month agreement with the Billy Barker Day Society to use the Billy Barker Day's office in Laborde Park as a temporary visitor center during the renovation of the museum and visitor center at a cost of $200 a month. Okay, on the recommendation, uh, Councillor Runge, are you moving? Yeah, Councillor Vic, second. Okay, questions or comments? Councillor Paul. Yes, thank you. The staff, has the um, uh, Friends of the Museum been given a heads up as to what the plan is here? Uh, I would have to ask Elizabeth if she's been in touch with anybody. I haven't been personally, but we can certainly do that. Yes, please do, uh, because um, uh, I, I don't want them to be surprised. Sure. And just so we're crystal clear, the Friends of the Museum have no management function associated with the museum whatsoever. So it would be just out of uh, politeness or whatever, 
uh, but it would not change uh, anything that we do as a council with our own building, our own museum, and our own facility. So, uh, so Director Norburn can give them a heads up if Elizabeth hasn't already. I would be very surprised if Elizabeth hasn't already had the conversation. Okay. Yeah, and I think the friends of the museum are very supportive of the renovation project, so they're you know they're excited about it going ahead. Yep. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, anyone opposed to the recommendation? So Jeff, uh, the motion's passed. Jeff, what do you think the time frame is going to be to get out a, a tender and to begin to see some work on the actual project? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So the uh, the architect was a, it had said that they would get the final specifications and drawings to us by the middle of May. They didn't quite make that deadline. They have said that they would get them to us by the middle of this week. So Wednesday, hopefully. I'm hoping that if I get that, I can get the, uh, the package out by the end of the week. If not, you know, absolutely uh, beginning of June, uh, you know, like the, for Monday or Tuesday uh, next week. Um, but I, okay. I would really like it to go out soon so that it can close in the month of June. Okay, crack the whip. Yes, I'm okay. cracking it. With your shoes on or on? Never mind. <laughs> you know that they're not. <laughs> we'll, no. just, we'll just leave that one alone. Okay. Um, we'll move on then to Sophie uh, from Director Bolton then. Sure. So Thanks, the, Jeff. The purpose of this report is to present the financial information required on the Section 168 of the Community Charter and the additional schedules required as part of our state financial information for 2019. So this is just information that we were required to report every year. So the statement of financial information is required on a yearly basis. The Community Charter also requires a yearly report. The expenses include all expenses incurred, not just from training and travel accounts. And I'll also note that even if they're funded by grants, the expenses are still included in the expense line. So the recommendation is that council receive for informational purposes, schedules B, C, and D of the city's 2019 statement of financial information, and that the mayor be authorized to sign the 2019 statement of financial, financial information on behalf of the council. Okay, can I have a motion to that effect? Councilor Runge, so move. Councilor Vick, second. Questions or comment? Okay, on the motion, anyone opposed? Seeing none, that motion has carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to correspondence. Uh, we have the query from Community Futures uh, for uh, the COVID-19 business support hotline uh, project. Uh, can I have a motion to provide uh, such a letter? <coughs> Councillor Runge, Councillor Elliott, second. Any questions or comments? Anyone opposed? That motion carried unanimously. And then uh, I'll have the city manager speak to the Barkerville uh, question with res uh, respect to the tender. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So Barkerville has made a request that uh, we would uh, sell them our excess water tanker truck. Uh, that surplus to the city's need, it's timed out. It's, it's, very, it's a very old unit, it's 40 years old. Um, the, this is a consistent request with uh, some of our previous actions that, our, we gave them our last fire engine, which became surplus. That was done on a gratis basis. Uh, that was, I believe, four or five years ago. I'm not exactly sure of that timing. And then as well, uh, we, the city has been providing some training assistance to the, to the uh, Wells Fire Department. Their goal is that they would take the, this fire tr uh, tender truck and put it into service. And again, it would serve as Barkerville, the Bowron and Wells area. So a lot of different areas would get service from that. And many of the members of the Wells Fire Department are also part of the Barkerville fire crew. So it, it's important it covers that whole area. From a staff perspective, um, Sylvan, our fire chief said that he was, that, uh, Mr. Coleman previously said he'd pay $5,000 or up to $5,000 for this truck in recognition of the fact that we recently put a set of tires on it and did a little bit of maintenance to the transmission. And Sylvan said that's completely fair value for the truck, so. Okay, so can I have a motion to respond in the affirmative to the request? Councillor Rudenberg, Councillor Runge, questions or comments? 
Anyone opposed? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the bylaw, uh, the solid waste collection and disposal amendments as discussed in the report, first, second, third, and final adoption. Uh, can I have a mover and seconder, please? Councillor Elliott, so moved. Councillor Rudenberg seconded. Uh, any further questions or comments? All those, I'm going to do a, 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 an up and down vote on this. So all those in favor, please put your hands up. Uh, and opposed? Councillor Runge, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, no changes to upcoming meetings, changes to committee appointments, uh, announcement, future events. There is no future uh, in COVID. <laughs> Um, okay, gallery questions. Hearing none, okay. I would ask uh, for a motion to recess and let's take a, a couple of uh, minutes. Uh, all council members, you have to now adhere because we're going to go into an in-camera meeting. You now have to adhere to the in-camera requirements uh, and that means that you need to make sure your office is secure and your headsets are on. So uh, we will take a two minute uh, break if you need to get some water, et cetera, before we go into in camera. So the regular meeting is now recessed. Uh, Byron, could you, ask, could you ask Gina to resend the in camera information please? Because